Welcome back, Rammies, to the podcast, Right Answers Mostly. And this is a very special episode because it's not only another episode of Ram. No. What is it, Claire? It's our hundredth episode. <laughs> Woo! We had to give like a really like <laughs> chilling, you know, intro. Of course. I can't believe we've said that like a hundred times of Welcome to Right Answers Mostly, a podcast on what you didn't learn in history class, but you really wanted to. And my like, name's Claire Donald. My name is Tess Blovo. <laughs> and welcome back, kids. Um, 100 episodes, Tess. And you know what's crazy is like, I think we just live in a world where like numbers, sometimes you just forget. Like, you know, you look at someone with like 100 followers and you're like, oh, that's not a lot of followers. And you look at like $100, and you're like, that's not a lot of money. 100 is like, to do these episodes, 100 is a huge triumph for us. It's actually crazy. Just the amount of research we've had to do, not to, you know, pat ourselves on the back but I think this is just like a collective celebration can, together a yes, hundred and we can pat ourselves on the back for this one yeah we I, can. I mean once a week releasing an episode on a new subject it has been crazy but it's also been like the most I, I say this all the time this podcast has been the most rewarding podcast and I have learned so much from this podcast I've learned about the world I've learned about myself like I've learned about you. I'm just so beyond grateful. I know. I know. I, f I feel the same way. Claire and I were talking the other day. We went on a walk and we were just talking about like being in LA for so long and always being freelance and having a lot of different jobs. Like I think for me personally, it's always been hard to have like my identity centered around a career because it's like it's hard in LA when you're meeting people and you're like, um, I'm a screenwriter. I'm an actor. And Ram is the first time that I've I have ever just felt this like pride and yeah. confidence in saying like I co-host a podcast and like just the amount of like love I have for it and you and this community like I just now say it so so comfortably and I'm like thank god we got there. No kidding and I couldn't agree more and like you hit you hit an important point with the community. I mean, especially lately, y'all have really been showing up in our DMs. And, and that is our favorite thing in the entire world. We love chatting with you guys on our DMs. And also, you know, we talk about more on Patreon, which we'll get into in a second, just some life changes and stuff. And the way that you show up for both of us in our personal lives is just, it's unbelievable, actually. It, yeah, it's absolutely beyond. And like the how you trust us too with yes. like sharing, you know, some very sacred, vulnerable pieces of information about yourself and your lives. Like Claire and I do not take that for granted. No, we're forever grateful. And someone has shared before that we've been playing like in the delivery room and as they were pregnant, it's just like, we feel so honored. We feel honored and privileged to be sharing this journey with you. And we love you, Rami, so fucking much. We, yeah, we really do. There's like no, no else. You know, there's, there's nothing there's else nothing to say. There's nothing else to say. And like for the OG Rammies, thank you. For the new Rammies, thank you. Thank you. Like we just can't get enough of you. And if you can't get enough for us, sorry, we do have to plug. Like not to seem not genuine because like we love it so much, but we are on Patreon as well. Yes. And like we obviously like Patreon is a paid subscription so yes. it goes to the pod but above that and beyond that it gives you a chance to get to know us better which just makes listening to our main feed episodes even more interesting and fun and fun yeah. and so we just like want we just want to all like hang out and be best friends yeah we just uh record an episode where we we're just talking about updates in our lives and some things that have been going on and some personal transitions and just like Man, how grateful I am for Tess and all of that. So that's oh. on Patreon. You get that. So we have 100 episodes in our main feed. We put out two bonus episodes a month on Patreon, and you have the whole catalog on that. So And we've been doing that over a year. Yeah. So there's like 30 episodes about maybe yep. at this point. Personal um, stuff, celebrity gossip. We've done conspiracy theory episodes. Like you get everything there. And on our close friends list on Instagram. Which is where shit goes down, as we always say. That's true. Like, and if you are on Patreon and you're not on our close friends list, DM us so that we can add you. Of course. Yeah. I I didn't want to deflate the excitement with um, the promotion, but I just want to give you guys even more content. Yes. And like people are, yeah, when, when they ask for it, you know, we want to give options. Absolutely. Of all of the things. So Tess, reflection, what are some of your favorite episodes that come to mind? Wow. Wow. Oh God. Shwow. Uh, wow. Okay. Here we go. Um, I think I'll always have a soft spot for some of the early ones. I know. You know, like when we were just like figuring it out and just like, that there was that spot where we transitioned from being really nervous to do an episode to like giggly and like let's just like release a little bit yes. and have fun with it. And so like I look back at the Donner party with like 
just <laughs> such such joy like Donner Party in Studio 54 I thought was like one of the first episodes where I was like holy shit like we got this like that was like the perfect mix of entertaining sexy knowledgeable yeah the Donner Party is fun and sexy guys <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> We were wearing I mean, bonnets for it. Depends. I look exactly. Depends. Studio I look at it. Four was like a fun recording. It was when it was at night, and that was a good time. Yes. when we recorded it. Exactly. Um, and then I look back on like a little bit, like over the summer. I think we got into like a really good stride mm-hmm. last summer, and I loved like the Frida Kahlo episode. That one spoke to you. So it deeply. really spoke to me so deeply, and it was one where I was just like, oh man, I'm so glad that we're like, it hit on like a more like personal, emotional level of like yeah. I'm so glad we're doing this, and we're like telling these women's stories mm-hmm. and. Um, talking about other issues as like reproductive health and like, you know, so I just, I love it all. It's so hard to, it's like picking a favorite child. I know it it truly is because these episodes and our Rammies are our children. Exactly. You're our babies. That's true. And there are some problem children, but we love you nonetheless. And we see you and we relate to you. (laughs) Exactly. What about you? What are ones to come that come to mind? I mean, Silk Road. It's like that one was so unexpected. If you guys don't know, Silk Road um, is the Amazon for drugs, and it's about this man who created it. It's such a crazy story. It's like it doesn't end there. Like it, it's a wild ride that you're just like, what? <laughs> it's and I just had no idea about it. So that one will always hold a dear place in my heart. Me too. Um, Monica Lewinsky from a recent episode, I love. Thank you. That was a great one. That Sororities, was a great one. I had so much fun. I know you had a little anxiety before we released it, and I, I loved sororities. I it's like an experience that you look back on that now you're like, I'm glad we did it. But yes. in the midst of it, you're like, how the hell? Where to start? Yeah, where to even start? Maybe it's just because it's so recently. But like Monica Lewinsky was one of my favorites in a very long time. Yeah, I had such a fun time doing that Me one. Too. Um, early two thousands, our first early two thousands one. That one in Salem witch trials. Oh my god, yes, guys, we have it early 2000s that is very just like a lot of things that you guys write in for us to do it's covered actually in early 2000s we do like five big stories yep um and for you gen z kids it's gonna feel like it's gonna feel like how we felt learning about like the 70s yikes (laughs) (laughs) yikes but not wrong um well speaking of early 2000s though tess unless you have anything else you want to say no please it's time guys yeah it wasn't really even a discussion of like what we were going to talk about. Of course not. On our 100th episode. No. Test tell him. It's Jessica Simpson. It's Jessica motherfucking Simpson. It's Jessica Ann Simpson, y'all. <laughs> it is Jessica Ann Simpson. Uh, what? To even say where to begin? Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm like, okay. Like, Overwhelmed. Like, take, take, take a breath. I mean, so this is what we did for our LA live show. Yes. Um. So if you went to the show and you're listening again, we're going to, you know. We're taking an even deeper dive because yes. we only had so much time on a live show. It was a Saturday night. You know, we didn't want to take up too much of your time. And we kept it a little bit lighter. Lighter. Exactly. There are some heavier things in this episode. So yeah, yeah you're going to get a new, if you've already seen us live, do, you're going to get a new, a new version of it in some way. But I mean... She is our she is our everything. She is something that Tess and I really connected on, um, and early in our friendship, I feel like people were always Brittany and Christina. People which love Brittany and Christina, but I was such a Jessica person. And when I met Tess, she was also such a Jessica person. And so we were both like, "Wait, did you watch Newlyweds?" And we both did obsessively. Of course, because it is it is the most iconic reality show of the early 2000s. It's so fucking funny. It inspired our fashion. It mm-hmm. inspired our personalities. It, it inspired really did. our sense of humor. Like, so much of her still resonates in me and, like, influenced me as a young child to a teenage girl to my adult life. Same. Um, we uh, have both seen her in concert when we were younger. And we went to her um, book signing February, January 2020, mm-hmm. pre pandemic, we did mushrooms with our friend Allison and we went to see her book signing where PETA stormed the stage not once but twice and truly tried to attack her where her <laughs> husband her now husband um defended her it was the hottest thing in the entire world and again like we're on mushrooms so we are like the vibes are crazy and our poor friend Allison who like gets dragged along to all these pop culture things is truly <laughs> sitting there like what is happening yeah we were not expecting that to happen but you know Jessica just she was like I'll pray for you and I wish that she goes I love what she say she was like I love your passion I just wish you didn't have to like diminish someone else's experience it was amazing and probably she should not wear fur if she does so um we will take that note as well that is one criticism yeah the only thing we'll ever say to Jessica is that we just wish you didn't wear fur yeah exactly everything else is perfection perfection and then we did meet her one night and we have talked to her about ram 
She knows about this podcast. Okay? Just let that sink in for a second. That's right. All you Jessica lovers out there. And her team knows about this podcast. And then hopefully one day she will be joining us, guys. And then if that happens, when that happens, we are manifesting because we manifested Watch What Happens Live. We can all like just scream together. I mean, she's our number one dream guest. Number she is one our dream idol. Guest. She is it would I mean, I could die happy. I really could. Same. Anything else you want to say about our girl before we get into it? Everything else is in the it's in is the, it's in the pages. It's in the work. It's in the work. Yeah, our citations are well, life, obviously. We've been studying her <laughs> since we were like eight years old. Truly. And the book, open book by Jessica Simpson, which you guys, I feel like this reignited celebrity memoirs. It is such a amazingly profound, beautifully written memoir. There is nothing cheesy about it. It is so vulnerable. It's so open. She she spills the tea too, which we are gonna get into. I mean, from us watching Newlyweds to then like hearing that she was coming out with this book to be like, I'm gonna talk about everything in my marriage and my divorce with my dad. Oh my, Joe Simpson. Joe I mean, Simpson. We, I was about to say, don't even get us started, but we will talk. Uh, just everything that we, we were dying to know since we were like 10. And she goes there. This book, I cannot recommend it enough. Please pick it up and read it. It's such a fast read too. So. I, 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 yeah. <laughs> She's speechless. She's speechless. I'm speechless. I'm so excited, Claire. We are um, drinking Diet Coke as well. For our girl. For that our, seems for, right. For our sober it? queen. Mm-hmm. 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 We love honoring the sober queens this year. We do. We do. I love that. Who would have thought? But here we are. But yeah, guys. Who would have thought we wouldn't be splitting a bottle of wine anymore? But that's when we were younger. Yeah, exactly. We're older now. But we'll always go back to our roots as well. Of course we will. All right, Tess. Jessica motherfucking Simpson. That is how my notes are titled. Of As they should be. Let's begin. Take it away. Jessica Ann Simpson was born. Tess, tell me her sign. She's a cancer. She's a cancer queen. Mm. She was born on July 10th, 1980 in Albion, Texas. Mm. She's the first uh, child of Tina Ann Simpson and of Joe Simpson. So yeah. <laughs> these two... These two are going to be a wild ride. They are a wild ride. Um, big fan of Tina now, actually. There are some troubling times in newlyweds, but I think she's found some peace. I think she was also going through a lot, projecting yeah. a lot. Yeah. And Joe, hey, I hope you're happy. I hope you're well. I am. That's to be determined. I mean, he's on an, an episode of Vanderpump. Yes. And that's the last time I saw him in the public eye, I Same. think. Was he, I don't think he was at the book signing. Tina was with her new husband. Yes, but I, don't I can't think, remember Joe was. I don't think he was. I think that was kind of a time of some some struggle, some estrangement. But, but Vander, anyways, Vanderpump. What does he say? Gut, gut in, dick out. <laughs> <laughs> so shocking. He's a celebrity photographer. Oh my god, that's one other like thing I need to say. Joe Simpson. When I had a web series and we were doing a bunch of social media, <laughs> he one time commented on our photo out of nowhere what? with just some thumbs up. <gasps> That is haunting. And then I remember messaging him, being like, hey, hey, Joe, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Newlyweds and Jessica Simpson. Like, if you ever want to work together, and he saw it and then never responded. <laughs> but we digress. But when you take a picture, remember the words of Joe Simpson, gut in, dick, dick out. out. <laughs> okay, moving on. Obviously, she has a younger sister, Ashley, living in the shadows, Simpson, also a queen. Pieces of me. Oh, so mm. good, that album. Um, so when Jessica was almost two years old, she was in this, like, terrible car crash with her mom how it happened is that tina was driving and then jessica decided she wanted mcdonald's and so who who, who amongst us who amongst us so she stood on the back seat and threw her arms around her mom grabbing her fo- face with both hands and was screaming mcdonald's so obviously she grabs uh, she covers tina's eyes so tina swerves and she hit i, I think a a pole or something like that she swerves across the road hits a pole jessica flew head first out of the windshield she goes halfway through it cracking her skull along the way she falls back onto the floor of the passenger side the glass like shatters on her tina's in terrible condition as well and had to be in the hospital for a week that is so scary how do you keep kids in like in their car seat well, I, it, they childproof lock. Oh yeah, it's, like, it's pretty oh, hard. I literally, I'm just like, how do, how does this not happen all the time? These well, little yeah. asshole kids <laughs> blinding their mothers, wanting McDonald's. Wow. Yeah. So so traumatic. Um. Obviously, she has 
brain trauma or not brain but head trauma from this yeah and she develops a stutter and um jessica's aunt was a speech therapist and so jessica's aunt suggested that she start singing her words instead of speaking her words because it would make her like slow down a bit and so jessica for the next two years uh the only time she wasn't stuttering is when she was singing so she began to sing everything oh I know. That is so sweet. Our little our little angel. Oh. Um, so eventually that gets worked out, but that's where her love of singing began. So early, so young. So as a kid, Jessica and her family were constantly on the move. Her dad, Joe Simpson, at this time was a Baptist preacher, which that makes you definitely move around a lot. But she said that her dad was especially restless. Oh, Joe. Oh, Joe. So they would move 18 times around Texas before Jessica made it to the fifth grade. I like was we were counting the other day how many times we moved in LA and I felt bad for myself that I'd moved like more than five. I, I can't imagine. Actually crazy. And then for a kid, there's like just so little stability in that way. It's just so hard. Yeah, and hard to make friends and hard to like have all the things that you need as a kid. Exactly. Um, so Ashley's also born around this time and Jessica just falls in love with Ashley. Jessica said that Ashley's like her little doll. She they were just always cuddling together, always together. Of course. And Ashley's like coming out singing living in the shadows (laughs) she's like i already resent you no kidding and she's not wrong yeah that she's not wrong um so her parents were actually constantly fighting over financial stress and like jessica took that on from a very early age that she needed to be the one to fix her problems like i think she i think they would just very openly talk about like i don't know how we're gonna get by this month which I understand that can be such a struggle, but I think talking about it in front of your kids can just be so tough because it's just something that a kid shouldn't necessarily have to worry about. No, there's some things to just make sure that they don't know. That they just feel safe. Ignorance is bliss. Yeah, because they can't do anything about it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, she takes that on from a very early age. And Tina, her mom, was also looking for ways to supplement the income. And she saw how much money Jane Fonda was making off of her workout tapes. They were the highest selling VH. VHS tapes. That's right. Which also we need to do a Jane Fonda episode one of these Oh, we days. have to. We would definitely will. So Tina was like, well, I can do that. And so she's like, I'm going to teach an aerobics class at church <laughs> of all places. I would have paid to be there. No kidding. So she creates this company called Heavenly Bodies. And she creates the class called Jump for Jesus. It's pretty good branding. Heavenly Bodies is so good, it's honestly. That reminds me of Heavenly Hunks, so those things from Costco. Heavenly Hunks. Have, have we ever gave you one? <laughs> what is Heavenly Hunks? <laughs> Was it Heavenly Hung on Heavenly Body? No, Heavenly Hunks. Oh. <laughs> Heavenly Hunks. What are Heavenly Hunks? They're like little like squares of like like chunks of like cookies and you put them in the microwave. Ah. They're like little blocks. Yum. Mm-hmm. I want one. I'll give you one. Soon. So she has to get, Tina has to get this approved by the church to be able to teach this class. So she goes in front of the deacon board and they're like all old country men. And they're like, you're going to teach acrobatics in church. And she's like aerobics. And they're like, why would you do that? And she's like, well, working out is really good for your heart. And they all just look at each other and like, look at her like, no. And then she's like, also, well, Jessica said in the book, quote, it was bad enough. My dad had an earring and now his crazy wife wanted people. (laughs) Sorry. And now his crazy wife wanted people dancing in the church. Finally, she hit on the point. I'm going to be helping women get their best bodies possible. And then all the men were like, of course, start your class now. And this will be a conversation throughout her entire story. Yeah, just like about bodies. About bodies, about like men validating women through Through bodies. Their bodies. Yeah, so it wasn't chill for heart health, but if we're going to get a heavenly body, let's fucking go. Then jump for Jesus, (laughs) y'all. Jump for Jesus. I want a shirt that says jump for Jesus. New new merch? New merch. Spring 2024. Look out for it. Um, so they, you know, in this class, they would work out to Christian pop songs, and she would say things like, lift those high, uh, lift those knees higher for Jesus. Yeah. And um, she, you know, she actually made some money for her family this way. She's an entrepreneur. I mean, she is an entrepreneur. She is. And she always has been. She is. And she knows that women need community. So we love that. That's all it is, isn't it? It's true. And speaking of women, Jessica was very close to the women in her family growing up. You know, it's just like a classic Texas upbringing. All of her cousins would just be outside in like big t-shirts, playing around. And she especially looked up to 
her older cousin, Sarah. And you know how, like, sometimes in your family you just have, like, a special bond with a cousin or an aunt or, like, maybe it's your sister. And, like, Sarah and Jessica were just, like, kindred spirits. Mm. Yeah. They had a really special connection. Cousin love is such a special love. It it is. I think we've talked about this before on Ramp. Like, it's just this, like cool there's always like a cool factor to them no matter like the age difference i have that for sure and it's the best you feel very protective of them you do and just like look up to them so much Mm -hmm. um she also said that the women in her family which you can relate to this have like really good intuition she was like the simpson women are a little witchy i understand tess's intuition is crazy i've had some some experiences recently where I was like, whoa. It, it's actually crazy. Um, and she said that her great grandma actually was like a tarot card reader. Oh, cool. Yeah, which I love that. So they're with their family all the time. Um, like I said, she's especially close to Sarah. But even there was things in Jessica's life that she was even keeping from Sarah. And I just have to give a little bit of a trigger warning. Um this is some discussion about sexual assault for the next few minutes. So Jessica was hiding something from everyone in her life. Um, A daughter of their family friend had been sexually abusing her for six years, from ages 6 to 12. They would go visit this family two to three times a year, and at night, the daughter, who was a year older than Jessica, would touch her inappropriately. And Jessica would make sure that she would never get to Ashley, the older girl, so she would, like, protect Ashley in this way of putting herself in the middle of them at night. Um... She said, Jessica said in her book, quote, the irony is that I was protecting, protecting my abuser. I thought that if I named what she was doing, she would feel the shame that I felt. And I wouldn't have, and I wouldn't have wished that on anybody. Oh my God. How much for a kid to, I mean, have to experience that and then to have to protect your little sister from it or like you still don't even understand like what's going on. You don't understand this at all and what's happening to you and you can't talk to any you feel like you can't there's already something in you that's like I feel like I can't talk about this and Jessica talked about in her in her book too it's like growing up as a southern baptist preacher daughter there's so much emphasis on saving yourself for sex and how like sex is only a pure thing when you are having sex with someone you love so then if you add in sexual assault on that it's like you're, you're doing something dirty even if you are a victim. Exactly. Exactly. So she, Jessica said she never slept well again. Um, <sighs> over, yeah. And over the years, Jessica learned that the girl was also being molested by an older boy. She said, quote, I can't play armchair psychiatrist and guess what her motives were for abusing me. But I can feel her pain and mine at the same time. Oh, it's such a vicious, vicious cycle, isn't it? It is. And, and that usually mm, is the cycle. I know. Um, so one day she finds enough strength to tell her parents from the backseat of her car. She said Ashley had her headphones on, so like she wasn't going to hear anything, and that she just all of a sudden felt the strength of like I need to tell them. So she goes, you know, hey, this girl's been doing this to me, and it makes me feel really uncomfortable. I don't know if you guys know that it's going on. And Jessica says that her mom just slaps her dad's arm and goes, "I told you something was happening." And neither one of them look at her. Neither one of them ask her any more questions. They never talk about it again. Uh, it gives me like full body chills. Like that 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 was Tina's response too. Of like, what do you mean? Like, what what did she mean by that? And like, how? I mean, I wonder if she knew what was going on with the girl. But like, how betrayed I would feel if I were Jessica to be like, w- yeah, what do you mean? You knew something was going on. And like, why didn't you do? If you, even if you had an inkling, why didn't you do everything in your power to remove me from having sleepovers then? Exactly. And then Jessica said that obviously, yes, they never talked about it, but they also never saw them again. But Jessica, to their reaction, says this in her book. I already understood denial and how much it fueled the actions of families, especially Southern families. People want to paint the picture pretty, especially ministers' family. Yeah, I mean, it's all like, if we don't ever talk about it again, it's like it never happened. But, you know, that's what a kid needs after that. Therapy. Deep therapy. Deep therapy and an open space to talk about it and to not take that shame on for the rest of her life. No kidding. No kidding. So that is just really heavy stuff that Jessica had to deal with so early on. Uh, Makes me so sad for her. Me too. But luckily she found, you know, some release and some escape in singing 
she starts singing in the church choir and entering singing competitions. And um, in sixth grade, she like really starts winning these sing- singing competitions. It always happens in sixth grade, doesn't it? <laughs> the change just begins. The change. <laughs> and then one of Tina's friends gives her a newspaper clipping from the Dallas Morning News that said the producers of the Mickey Mouse Club were looking for new talent. We're talking the Mickey Mouse Club, y'all. It all goes back to the Mickey Mouse Club. To Mickey Mouse Club. <laughs> Obviously, we talked about this in our Britney Jean Spears episode. Yep. And we're going to talk about it again. So mm. they were um, they held open call auditions for 50,000 kids around the country. It's a lot of stage parents. Haunting, honestly. <laughs> Everything about it. Imagine how long those audition processes must have been. Oh, my God. I just like, absolutely not. So Tess, or Tess, Tina and Jess, their name together is Tess. Honored. Honored. So Tina and Jess go to the audition. They wait in line for hours. Which I would absolutely not do. Imagine the heat. Uh, in Texas, in Ugh. Dallas. No, thank you. And uh, Jess auditions by singing Amazing Grace. So intense. <laughs> For like a sixth grader. She's, and of course, like I feel like every kid that's like, I can sing, just go straight into Amazing Grace. Of course. I mean, a stunning song. Yeah. <laughs> but there's a time and place. <laughs> well, find you a girl who can do both tests because she sang Amazing Grace and she did a dance to Ice Ice Baby. <laughs> I feel like this is like you as a child. <laughs> I'm kidding, it is me as a child. Like a little religious, a little pop culture girly. Yes, exactly. Um, when I was in a pageant one time, I did a hip hop dance to Footloose. So, <laughs> and I did not win. How that I year. wish we had that footage. I'm sure it's somewhere, and it will be hidden. Maybe on Patreon, if that will get you guys on Patreon. Please, <laughs> I'll do please. anything. I'll do anything for that. <laughs> so she actually gets a call back. And um, then she moves on to the casting camp in Orlando. But they were like, you're great. You're a great singer. You have great presence. You really need to work on your acting, though, if you're going to get further in the process. Well, they're not wrong. We have seen – we've seen Employee of the Month. We've seen Dukes of Hazard. Of course. We've seen her on that 70s show. You know, sometimes, though, like, I can feel her acting career. She – she doesn't judge herself, no. which I love. Um, that recent tuna of the or chicken of the sea or audition commercial she did with Maxwell, I was so impressed. They were both very present. They well, were. Maxwell's gonna be. A, you know that she's gonna be a star. Maxwell's a star. We're all just waiting for it. Her and Northwest just hanging out together on the private jet. It's gonna be intense. <laughs> Whatever's about to happen. That is true with us. So they send her to Chuck the Chuck Norris School of Acting, like the Chuck Norris, and the Chuck Norris actually taught that acting school. So um, she goes to that, and as he as she's acting, he like stops her, and she's, and he's like, you you have too much expression on your face, <laughs> which is strange to tell an actor. And she was like, okay, and then he was like, do you know who the best actor in the world is? Denzel Washington. <laughs> do you know why? Because he doesn't move his eyebrows. <laughs> he's like embody that to a like twelve year old girl. girl. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, and go. Do it again. He's like, that felt better, didn't it? She's like, "Uh uh-huh. Always classic acting teachers. Classic. So how do you fix moving your eyebrows? He taped her eyebrows down. He taped her eyebrows down, a 12-year-old. Jessica did not like this. And then he has her do the scene. And then I'm sure he was, like, much better. He's like, oh, my God, my work. (laughs) My work. It's all the work. Yeah. If you guys are struggling actors right now, maybe try taping your eyebrows down. Just see what comes up. That will do it. Yeah. So now that the eyebrows aren't moving, they can go to Orlando. And so they go there to the casting casting camp. And when they get there, there was this kid running around the pool, showing off like the audition had already started. Oh, I wonder who that was. He goes up to Jessica and he says, Hi. I'm Justin Timberlake. Boo! (laughs) Boo! Classic. Of course he's running around the pool, showing off. Don't, like, introduce yourself to her like you fucking own the place. He has, like, his swim trunks on. He's running around the pool, and then he goes and does a backflip, and he, like, will not stop. He, like, just starts doing, like, push-ups on the concrete. (laughs) Yes, exactly. (laughs) So Justin Timberlake's there, and right after that, another boy appeared. He was all the way from Canada, and Jessica said that everyone had a crush on him. Ryan Gosling. Yay! Yay! <laughs> oh, what a hunk. Uh, Ken? Ken. Ken? Isn't that crazy? Like, I'm just Ken. Anywhere, anywhere else I'd be a 10. ten. He was a 10 at the Mickey Mouse Club, though. Like, he, everyone he's loved been a 10 him. forever. Forever. And it, he just seems so sweet. So everyone had a crush on Ryan. And then there was this girl from Pittsburgh that Jessica describes as shy and mousy. Christina Aguilera. 
the the subtle way that Jessica will like describe Christina and her interactions makes me think that she's not a fan. And the same with Brittany Jean in her book. But Jessica never like shit talks Mm-mm. anyone in this book, even people that have like fucked her over. But there is something about Christina that I'm almost like, does she hate her the most out of it's wild. Anyone in her life? It's subtle. Also, like Jessica really doesn't shit talk like ever. No, she she really doesn't. Like she she explains her own side of things. What does she say about the photographer that doesn't have the thumb? Oh, well, I feel bad because he he was a nice man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel bad because he was a nice man. She like doesn't want to do a photo shoot on newlyweds. And she's like, mm. and she's like making like, all these like baby faces. She doesn't want to do it because he doesn't have a thumb. And Nick's like, don't be mean. And she's like, and it's just like it's distracting. <laughs> and then she does the photo shoot. And it's like amazing. And then she like apologizes to Nick for ever doubting him. She is a sweetheart. She is. She's just a sweet Southern gal. She really is. And she just like wants to be nice to people. It's true. So, okay. We're into the boot camp now. Um, and it's like a two-week boot camp of singing, dancing, acting lessons. And there were 11 of them, but only eight can move forward. Isn't that kind of fucked up? Like, at least have like three move forward out of 11. Like, it just seems so like cut and dry. Yeah. It's like, couldn't you narrow it down a little bit more? But God, is that even more painful then? No, I, I don't know. know. Only it's a few tough. that have to leave. Oh God, I wouldn't be happy. I would just be devastated. I would not be strong enough at this age to be doing that, you know? No. And Lord knows I wasn't. Yeah. So the final audition day is, is there and Jessica's feeling pretty good about herself, but in walks this girl. And she has brown eyes like Jessica. She's Southern like Jessica. And it is none other than Brittany Jean Spears. And here we go. And here we go. And Jessica literally was like, fuck. I mean, they do when they were younger. They look a lot alike. And such similar vibes. For sure. Brittany could always dance better. Britney's singing was incredible. But later, I think. I mean, they, they're so different. It's hard to even compare them. And they are so different. And also, like, Jessica never wanted her career to be like Britney's career. And we'll see that later. But it's like there was never – people made it seem like there never was enough room. Exactly. You know, there only had to be this or that. And now we know that's just not the case. It's just not the – yeah, there's enough pie for everybody. Truly. So Christina goes on before Jessica for her final audition, and she's just unreal. Like, Jessica said that she was, like, must have been holding back during the camp. Because, like, Christina has had her voice since she was, like, little. Like, it hasn't changed. Like, it's been, like, from when she was, like, six. (laughs) It's crazy. And she said that everyone was just, like, jaw dropped And she is, like, 5'2", isn't she? She's little. Yeah. God damn. So everyone's like, okay, obviously she's getting in. And Jessica's like, how am I supposed to follow that up? You know? Oh, there's no worse feeling. No. So she just completely gets in her head and freezes when she goes on. She she forgets her choreography. She can't remember her lines. And she said the theater was just silent. And this is in her nature that we see. She really freezes and she'll always struggle with, like, the pressure. Yeah, I th- I think because people have told her you're just not talented enough, like mm. which is crazy, which is crazy. Mm. Um, so she walks off the stage, and Justin Timberlake goes, "Ooh, what did you just do?" Okay, <laughs> someone needs to slap this this child. <laughs> I said it. Okay, she said it, folks, and she this man, it. and I've already said that in the Britney episode. It's but just like. This is where we start course correcting. When we see this behavior here is when we start course correcting. Yeah, start it now. Start it so now. that he doesn't go on to be a complete monster of a human. So that he doesn't go, I want to apologize to absolutely no one. And oh. they, when he did Oof. that, Oof. I'm so angry. I'm so angry. <laughs> So then Brittany goes on and does her routine, and Jessica just knew it was over for her at this point. Like, it was done. And it's really hard because Jessica's, like, carrying the responsibility, her financial or her family's financial responsibility on her back. Jessica has a really hard time adjusting to life back in Texas. Like, the kids thought she made the whole Mickey Mouse Club thing up and that whole audition project. They were just very terrible to her. Vicious. Also, Jessica starts getting huge boobs. Like, the boobs we see today – started happening when she was like in seventh grade and that is not easy for a young girl no and you know like when you're younger you you think that that's like you're like oh that's amazing that someone else has boobs and like because I was like pretty flat chested and now I'm just like that would have been really difficult to like it's present yourself in the world with like an adolescent woman yes girl 
with womanly breasts. Exactly. Like your body is already changing so much. And then to have to deal with that. And like the girls are mean to you because you have big boobs and the boys are weird and gross to you. And it's not even just boys. Like we see from a very young age that there's so much em- emphasis on her sexuality and body, whether she's like trying to, like she would try to cover up because she felt uncomfortable. In the seventh grade, the pastor at their church tells her mom Quote, Jessica can't sing in front of the church because you could see her breast and that will make men lust. A seventh Maybe grader. Kick the men that are <laughs> lusting over a seventh grader out of your stupid church. I think that's the problem, not the seventh grader. That is, I can't believe. Who's doing nothing? I mean, it's, it's, it's classic. Like, it's classic. It, it's very foul. It's shocking. So... She, you know, is having this transition. She missed the kids at the Mickey Mouse Club, and she was heartbroken from not making the cut. And, like, Tina sees how hard this is on Jessica, and she was like, listen, we're not doing this entertainment thing anymore. Like, this is just too much on all of us. And what do you think Joe was like, Tess? Joe's like, that's not true. <laughs> Joe's like, she's just getting started. Babe. Truly. He's like, give me 10 years. Yeah. Joe, Joe was like, we have to keep going. So he starts acting as her manager. But... Just to go back on where she is in school, because she still is in school. She has a hard time making friends, but she joins the cheerleading uh, team. And she starts to like, make some friends there, or how she thinks, or people she thinks are her friends. She becomes close with one girl who she calls in her book Beetlejuice. Mm. This girl confides, confides in Jessica that she knows someone who is being molested. And Jessica says, that happened to me. You need to tell your friend to tell an adult and not keep it a secret to anyone anymore. Oh, look at her like champion for other survivors. I know. I know. Oh, Angel. So the story doesn't end there. In school, everyone found out that this guy named Mark had a crush on Jessica. Because, like, I'm sure every Who single guy. wouldn't? <laughs> every single guy and girl had a crush on Jessica. Because, again, how could you not? So... The fake friend, Beetlejuice, was had a crush on Mark, and she was obviously very jealous of Jessica. She starts telling people in school that Jessica is a lesbian and tried to make a move on her when, when they were at a sleepover. Jessica said, quote, Beetlejuice had taken my story of abuse and told everyone that I had done this to her at one of the sleepovers. And then it just starts to become this chain reaction because three of this girl's friends start being like, she did the same thing to me. And Jessica was like, I'd never been alone with those girls, let alone at a sleepover with them. That is so painful. And so, like, can you imagine when you're a kid having that kind of, like, rumor? It is. It just starts the most horrific chain of bullying. Her her house gets egged. Someone uh, scrawled "die bitch" and shoe polish across her house. She didn't go to school for two weeks. People put trash in her lockers. Oh my god! They put like anti gay stuff all over oh her lockers. Yeah, her mom and then Tina says to Jessica, "We've got to do this, Jess." Later, like telling her, "Like you've got to go back to school." And then Jessica said, later that emphatic we would mean me going on stage no matter how I felt or doing an interview with someone I didn't want to talk to about my personal life. So Jessica already is like feeling her parents being like, you might not be in the best place, but you have to do it. We have to do it. And it's like, you don't have to go to school and have all these people viciously bully you. No, and she's probably also like, you've never even talked to me about this, what happened, you know? And like, that's like the core of what they used to against her I mean it's it's just so gross on so many different levels what these kids did they um at a pep rally she goes back to school and the other cheerleaders uh start chanting lesbian at Jessica which is also gross that she took her story of abuse and then they turned it into her being gay and use that as an insult as well it's just so there's so many levels to it who are these little bitches i where, hope, where are you now are you listening i hope that you're so ashamed of yourself and that you have taught your children to never do anything like that do better well luckily there was at least one nice girl that jessica in her book calls lisa who went on to become a successful therapist and jessica says if you're being bullied whether it's because you're gay or someone decides they don't like something about you let me be the lisa who says i see you you are perfectly made i have chills i know i love her <laughs> <Me too. sighs> yeah so again like she's just going through the ringer um in her childhood but like we said before joe does not want 
to stop <laughs> at all. He's like, sorry about that. Anyway, how do I get 10%? Exactly. So he's acting as her manager, and he organized this church camp that summer and invited a reverend who was starting a gospel uh, record label called Proclaim, Proclaim Records. And Joe at this camp was teaching about teen abstinence. Jessica sings, I will always love you, telling the crowd it was about true love waiting. Of course. Which, like, that's an interpretation if I've sure, ever heard Sure, sure. Whatever you want to say. Um, she impresses this guy so much that he signs her to her record label. And her first song is God Says Wait. Yeah. It's just like the emphasis on purity is so troubling to me. I mean, well, it's just going to affect her her entire life and career. And so it does. It's really just like you just – it's upsetting. So while this is happening, she's making her way through the Christian and gospel circuits. And then she's kind of like, okay, I'm, I've had enough of like the Christian and gospel music. It can only take me too far or, or so far. And when she's 16, her vocal co- coach has some connections and gets her some meetings with labels in New York. Um, they get this call – from this woman, Teresa La Barbarera, uh, La Bar- Barbarera Whites, and she was a Dallas-based A&R rep for Columbia under Sony, and she had heard some demos of Jessica, and she was anxious to meet her, so anxious that at eight months pregnant, she flies to Dal- or to San Antonio or somewhere. She flies to where Jessica is and is like, I got to see these pipes in person. She's on Newlyweds a lot. She is. And also, Teresa, if you didn't know, was working on another young singer from Texas at this time, a little Beyonce Knowles. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I love Beyonce and Jessica have this friendship. Yes. And it's incredible. It's so powerful. These Texas girlies stick together. Oh, they know. It is so powerful. So, Jessica sings Amazing Grace for Teresa again. Hey, I mean, if it hits, it hits. Hey, she knows, yeah, she knows her range. She knows her stuff. Yeah. And she also sings I Will Always Love You for Teresa. Teresa was like, you are amazing. We have to go to New York, like, right now, and you need to do exactly what you did here for everyone else. So Joe's trying to play it cool, and she's like, yeah, Jessica's going to meet with Epic already and all of this. And Teresa's like, I can get you straight to Tommy Matola." the head of Sony. So they fly to New York that night. And from the start, it's interesting. When Tina um, at Mickey Mouse Club with Brittany and Christina, she was like, I feel like this isn't the end of the road with these two girls. I feel like you're going to see them again in your life. And boy, did she. Because from the start, Jessica's just getting compared to Brittany and Christina. She went in auditioned at um, Jive and they're like you're great but we already signed this girl Britney Spears and she's too similar to you they go meet with another record at RCA and they're like we just uh, signed this girl Christina Aguilera something (laughs) (laughs) and Jessica's like Christina Aguilera yeah they're all so different too like they they are are. so different in like their vibes and looks and music yeah everything yeah because they're just blonde and that's how we used to like to talk about women exactly and they're like they can only be one so, but then she finally meets with Tommy Matola in his office, and the president of Columbia Records is also in the office, and Jessica sings Amazing Grace a cappella. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> she will not stop. And I will always love you again. And Tommy stops her in the middle and is like, that's enough. And then he says, as far as I'm concerned, I would sign you today. Your music is fantastic how it is. So she's stoked right now. She receives offers from Mercury and Atlantic, but ultimately she goes with Tommy at Columbia. And right after she signs the contract, here's the butt test. They take a picture and Tommy looks her up and down and says, okay, you got to lose 15 pounds. She's 17 years old, by the way. He said, "She's got you got to lose 15 pounds um, because that's what it will take to be Jessica Simpson. Talk about damaging. Can you imagine getting that ingrained in your 17-year-old mind? This is a man that just told you that he can take you to the top, but you got to lose 15 pounds. To be yourself. To be yourself. I mean... And she says that they were all just, like, so country. Like, they're they're so green. They're from Texas. So she didn't have anyone being like, shut up, Tommy. Right. Also, like, she's a perfect, beautiful angel that doesn't need to do anything. She's 17 years old. She's a child still. So this begins her journey and struggle with extreme dieting um, and diet pills. And her mom, like, really doesn't do anything to help her all through this process. Like, we see with Tina. Tina's like, I'll start Atkins with you. I'll do this with you. Instead of being like, how's your heart? Right. Like, do you – should we be doing this? Should I be standing up for you again? Like, it's just kind of that – it's that star fuckery energy a little bit too. And I know it's not as simple as that, but like I it mean, is. 
Tina and Joe definitely have that energy for sure. I think, I mean, you see it on new, and I think like I have space for Tina now, but I think on newlyweds, it is disturbing to watch how she talks about her diet with Jessica. It is. She's like, oh, Jessica, that's not in your diet. <laughs> you do such a good Tina. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you sound just like she's her. like, the diet makes you mean. Th- they, that's what they say to her all the time. It's like, because well, like, she's not eating. Yes. The woman is not eating. Yeah, it, but then I feel like Tina and Joe are like, well, that's our meal ticket, too. So we need to listen to Tommy. It's, yeah. This is why it's like your parents can't be your meal ticket in this way. Absolutely not. They should be your safe place. Yeah, exactly. So Jessica does a month of her senior year of high school, and she's like, I won't be needing this where I'm going. So she drops out, and Jessica and her whole family, including Ashley, drive from Dallas to Los Angeles. And this was the day before Ashley's 13th birthday. I'm living in the shadows. <laughs> Someone else's dream. <laughs> oh, sweetheart. And it all makes sense. It's so tough. God, watching also Ashley, we'll post this on our story this week, play her music for Jessica and Tina. When they're just in her apartment and Tina's just nodding with her hand over her <laughs> mouth and Jessica's like hovered in a corner, just like not even paying attention. It's so sad. It's really, really tough to watch. It is tough to watch. Um, So the process of making Jessica's first album is longer than they expected because they have to keep pushing it back because they were going to release it. And then Britney would release an album and then Christina would release an album. And they're like, well, we can't do it at the same time. Mm -hmm. And they also like couldn't figure out which direction they were wanting to go with her. First, it's like, let's make you really pure. And then Britney puts out a song and they're like, no, let's make you sexier. And you need to learn all of these dance moves. And like our girl Jess is just like not a dancer no she does try yeah but she doesn't get it she's not and then like i think what tommy matola really saw her as which i think this actually works for her is like a mix of britney and mariah kind of like it's ballads but it's not like yeah it's like a southern girl but with ballads totally you know totally and jessica throughout this whole process is like well i'll just do whatever you say because all i want is to be on the radio Um, And she does get a song on Dawson's Creek called Did You Ever Love Somebody? And this is huge for her. And then this guy is like, hey, I want to co-manage Jessica with you to um, Joe Simpson. And his name is Paris Paris Dijon. And he's like, I'm also co-managing or I'm also managing this boy band. They're playing at a parade. Why don't you guys come to the parade? Jesus, take the wheel. Jesus, Jesus, take take the the wheel. So Jessica said she sees the most adorable guy she had ever laid eyes on. And he saunters over to her and he says, hi, I'm Nick. And Jessica said she thought, hello, my life. Oh, I have chills. I have the fucking chills. I have the fucking chills. So this is none other than Nick Lachey. Nick, what, Beep. what, did, he, what yeah, <laughs> Beep out his name. What did he say on Love is Blind? He's like, and I'm obviously Nick Lachey. And everyone's just like silent, just <laughs> blinking. They're like, wait, who is that again? So yeah, this is Nick Lachey. He was in this band, 98 Degrees, and shows she goes home and just researches all about 98 Degrees. He was 25. She was tw- She was 18. Um, he was from Cincinnati. He was in the band with his brother, Drew. We do love Drew. Drew is, like, so Ble- sweet. Bless Drew. Bless Drew. Um, the next time they see each other is at a teen people party, and he was wearing red overalls with the left strap off and a cream turtleneck. <laughs> <laughs> I can picture – I feel like the overalls were, like, corduroy almost, you know? I just threw up in my mouth. I know. It's really tough. It's... But for Jessica, she was like, hubba, hubba. I mean, it was a time that was there, you know, 90s, still like 98, 99. Yeah, exactly. Okay. That's, and well, that fits. That's one thing we can give them. Yeah, exactly. We'll give them that and that's it from that's this whole episode. It. That is it. So they chat. He gets her number and Jessica, Jessica swears to her mom. What does she swear to her mom? I'm going to marry that man one day. That's right, Tess. That's exactly right. Don't come for us on TikTok, people, even though you do every day for this one <laughs> post that we did. That we said that we don't believe in meeting someone or seeing someone and be like, I'm going to marry that person one day. Like, no. based on what? You just say, I want to I want to fuck, fuck him one day. <laughs> Let's be honest. And that I understand. Lust is a hell of a drug. For sure. But love, if you don't even know their name pretty crazy it is we just have to admit it's crazy it is we have to call it like it is so he ends up calling her up he's like hey i dumped my makeup artist girlfriend after i met you let's (laughs) hang out they have a night on a hotel rooftop in la and it's like one of those nights that you're just like talking about you're learning everything about each other that's sweet it is sweet. sweet and then he touches her hand and it's like an electric shock but then she pulls back and she says i have to tell you something and he says okay and she goes there's something i need you to know right away 
I'm a virgin and I don't want to have sex until I until it's with the man that I've married. And he's like, God <laughs> damn it. <laughs> I mean, I think internally, yeah. Yeah. Could you not? At a yeah. 25 also, year old like, man and a boy band? And a boy band. I mean, so he's seven years older than her, right? Um, he's twenty five, she's eighteen. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little gross. It's weird. Like, yeah, she's legal. Don't come for us. But like it's a little weird. Imagine like just because you can doesn't mean you should. Yeah. You're just in different places of your life too. You are. I wonder how many people Nick had had sex with before. You think a lot? A lot. Yeah, that's true. Like, listen, 98 Degrees was never my jam, but at one point, like, they had a platinum album, so. I'll yeah. give him this. He was a handsome man. He was really hot. Very, I remember very handsome. watching Newlyweds and being like, whoa. Oh, he looks like an all-American, just sweet boy with a little. He had an earring in the early 2000s and his piercing blue eyes. Tattoos. Yeah. He had know, big lips. He did. I'm like, are we okay? <laughs> And that's the last. Well, okay, I have one more nice thing to say about 90 Yeah, because we'll shit on it the whole second yeah, half yeah, of this yeah. episode. So. I have one more nice thing about 90 say Degrees. It. True to your heart. You, you must be true to your heart. heart. That's an iconic song from Mulan. Good good that they landed Mulan. With Stevie Wonder, that no less. That must have been a good little paycheck. Probably their only real paycheck. <laughs> yeah. That went fast. With probably, all the light. With, with all those um, members in that band. But Yeah. Well, he ends up being like, oh, that's chill. I respect that. He's like, you can give me a hand job. <laughs> of course. <Okay. laughs> so she ends up opening up for 98 Degrees on tour. Ashley's 14 at this point. And so since Jessica's on the road, they're like, well, shit, what do we do with Ashley? So they were like, make her a backup dancer. <laughs> Ashley was um, had taken some ballet lessons, but honey, she did not know hip hop. I could have taught her a thing or two with that footloose routine uh, that for, I had. For sure, you really could have. Yeah, but so she ends up making it work. Actually, if you look at the music video for "I Think I'm in Love with You" by Jessica, Ashley's a backup dancer. Good for her. Um, so Jessica's mom, Tina, just absolutely loves Nick, and we see this with all the partners that Jessica has. She just falls in love. Joe does not. Because Joe is like someone else is giving you advice and you're not going to me for everything he that you need. He feels threatened mm -hmm. while Tina feels like turned on. Like infatuated with him. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So um, Jessica, they start moving along in their relationship. Jessica goes to Victoria's Secret with Tina to pick out a bra for the first time that um, Nick's going to touch her boobs. So if you are looking for some mother-daughter activities, I don't know if I'd do that, but that could be one. I mean, I went there with my mom in, like, high school. Oh, for sure. But I would never tell. But not for your boyfriend to no, touch No, and boobs. I also wasn't I wasn't buying bras for anyone to touch <laughs> my boobs, but, you know. Oh, man. Yeah, but they were. Yeah. So um, Nick is at his peak with 98 Degrees. Um, they have an album, like I said, that goes platinum. Jessica's career is building, but, like, Jessica was always very much Nick's plus one in this. Remember this. Remember that at the beginning. This is how it started. Yep. Nick is a star, and Jessica star is rising. Um, and but, but Jessica is working like crazy because she does want to be so successful, and Joe is also afraid of saying no to anything. And Nick would be like, "You're doing way too much," and then Joe would be like, "Shut up, Nick." <laughs> um, and Jessica really feels like she doesn't have any say in all of it. Um, what she sings, what she looks like. She's working so much that she gets a cyst on her right fallopian tube, which is just like unreal pain. And she Ugh. has to get an emergency surgery and then she performs a showcase the next day. Oh, God, that poor thing. That poor thing. I mean, she said it all pays off because she's over the moon and like couldn't be more excited to hear her song on the radio. Um, and then they do a music video. I think it was for Irresistible. Um, and then Tommy Matola uh, sees it and he says, you can do better. I want a six pack for the next video janet jackson abs guys if you see her in the irresistible music video she is so small has the flattest most like concave like that yeah like it's disgusting that he would like criticize that and like sweetheart with love and light like do you have janet jackson abs i don't think so who does who, besides janet jackson literally because those are her abs like it is just crazy so he Again, like he just Tommy wants her to lean into this like sex pop virgin thing. Um, yuck. And Jessica was like, it was really hard to be sexy as someone who had literally never had sex before, you know. 
And so they're just trying to figure that out. Her and Nick are dating. She does this interview with teen people in which they ask her about being a virgin. And she says that she is a virgin. And this story just takes off. Well, this was such an in thing. Yeah. And she's 19 years old. And they're like, you've never had sex before? And they're like, Nick, how are you okay with this? How do you do it? God. <laughs> and then Nick and Jessica, so they're starting to be together as more of a couple. They get the very first issue of Teen Vogue. They get the very first cover of Teen Vogue ever. I remember it. It's it's the best cover. Oh, it's so good. She's in this like cream sweater and jeans. Mm. They're on the beach in Malibu. Um, and it's it's major and it's so much exposure because to release Teen Vogue, they sent every single Vogue subscriber an issue of this Teen Vogue. And on the cover, it read, Pop's new princess, Jessica Simpson, in huge red and beneath in smaller black ink, it said, and Nick too. Here we go. And so Here begins. we fucking go. So begins. So we this will be a theme that we see throughout their whole relationship. But Jessica's dad was like, you can't get married until you're 21. Like, you don't know who you are yet, which I think is fair criticism. But I also think that, like, he just wanted control of her. Yeah, it wasn't, like, the best intentions. Yeah, exactly. And Nick, Nick and Jessica do start already having problems. They spent most of their time apart. Um like or they spent most of their time before they get married just by working together the longest amount of time they had spent together before they get married is a week yeah that's not okay (laughs) that's not okay they both had apartments in the same building and that was like their version of living together and and then also at this time like she said that her childishness that once was cute to nick because she's so much younger to her it's just like not as cute anymore and so they're just growing further apart and she realizes that she went from doing everything that her dad had told her to do to everything that Nick had told her to do and so she's like I just need to like find out who I am without and like my value without measuring it based on someone else's love so she decides they need to take a break she goes on tour with Destiny's Child again Queen Bee Um, Her album, Sweet Kisses, goes triple platinum, and Columbia throws her this massive party where she arrives on a yacht. Oh, good for her. (laughs) No kidding. And there was a red carpet and a 15-minute fireworks show. And then 10 days later, her album, Irresistible, came out and sells double in the first week what Sweet Kisses did. So she's just, like, killing it. And then Nick and Jessica go through times of talking, but they were done until... September 11th. You know, it's a <laughs> wow. 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 If anyone, if anything is going to bring two people together, it's September 11th. It is. Yeah. Bet you didn't think I was going to say September 11th brought them no. together, huh? No, you really didn't. Yeah. So also, you guys keep suggesting that we cover September 11th and not doing it. We're just absolutely not going to do- with love and light. No. With love and light, absolutely not. It's just it's- not going to happen. We understand that some of the younger Whammies that weren't alive yeah. want to know about it from our perspective. And it's still just something that's really It's too close. Too close and hard to talk about. And like it's not in our style because there's nothing light about it. Yeah. And we can't do it, you guys. Yeah. So we're just not going to. But um thank you for your suggestions and please send them in at um right answers mostly on Instagram. <laughs> yes, thank you for yes, but we just are stop stop telling us. Yeah. Stop <laughs> asking us to do no, that. No September eleventh. But September eleventh did happen and Jessica was, I think Nick was in New York. One of them were were in New York. Nick was, I think. Nick, yeah. And he calls her and he's like, have you seen the news? So then he was like, this is all happening. Um, I, This makes me realize that I only want to be with you, Jessica. Oh, God. Guys, yep. I mean, it was a terrible thing, but don't let that get you back into a toxic relationship. <laughs> Jessica said, after 9-11, I knew that I never, ever wanted to be away from Nick for the rest of my life. <laughs> Oh, no. It's so crazy. So when they get back together, it was like simply understood that they would marry. He proposes to her on a sailboat in Hawaii with a, per, a pear-shaped diamond. I'll never forget. She's wearing that hat on the boat. She's like, we're engaged. <laughs> we're engaged. <laughs> Brittany Cartwright, I'm engaged. Truly like that, but different. <laughs> it is. You know? It's, it's the, similar um, style. Similar vibes. So. Um, so they decided on an October wedding, Nick asked for a prenup. Which Jessica was not happy with. Ladies. Hindsight is so 2020. Let's talk about a prenup for a second. When you get in a car, you put your seatbelt on, right? 
Because you're not expecting to get in a car crash, but you're always going to be safe if you do get in a car crash. So when you're getting married, you don't expect to get divorced, but you put your seatbelt on. Protect yourself from everything that life could throw at you, That's right. ladies. Sign those goddamn papers. That's right. So you know Jessica was like, She's that's, like, you don't love me. Yes, that's not romantic. Oh, that's what you, she's 22 years old. Of course she's going to say that. Yeah, and she does not realize where her career will go. So no. Nick drops it, and Joe was awful through the whole wedding process. He's like telling both of them that it's a mistake that they're getting married, and Jessica was on diet pills, so she said she was speedy and hungry. But against all odds, on uh, they get married in a Texas chapel on October 26. And it was a rainy day. And before they walk down the aisle, Joe tries to convince her not to do it. He's like, you don't have to do this. We can leave right now. Don't do that. Uh, do not do that. God, she looks so gorgeous, though. I just like, can't help but think of that dress. I know. And it was like a very... Well, this reflects their whole relationship because they go to, like, Red Robin and Applebee's all the time. It was a very, like, not fancy wedding for a celebrity. No, it was very low-key. I mean, she wore, like, a very expensive, like, Vera, it was Vera Wang, right? Probably, if that wasn't her second. I think, yeah, I think it was. And, yeah, she's pretty, like, it's elegant and, like, understated. Yeah. It's pretty, like, classy for an early 2000s, like, Texas wedding. That is very true. I mean, his tux is still, like, the oversized tux that's so hideous. And, like, yeah. I think, like, a pink tie or something yeah, like that. Yeah, not but, great. But she, she's everything. And he's just kin. I mean, literally her. I mean, like, God, she probably was so miserable because she was I so, know. so hungry. So hungry. And her dad's telling her, like. Didn't they have to keep taking her dress in? Yeah, like, for sure. Right? Oh. Well, I, I'm sure she was like, a lot of brides get stressed even before their wedding. And then you have your dad being like this on top of it. This poor thing. And then you have your husband probably already pissing you off. Yeah, exactly. So they get married. Um, and what does everyone want to know after the wedding? How Did they? Did you do it? Did you? Do, how was the sex? That's right, Tess. And how was the sex? Jessica said, I had joined a long line of virgins in my family who said yes to forever for that one experience. <laughs> <laughs> Just shuts the laptop. <laughs> I open mine. Oh, guys, we forgot to tell you that we're splitting this episode up much like in the live show. Oh, yeah. This is going to be a... Uh... This is our first. Is this our first time we've ever done this? Yes, this is the first time we're splitting it up. So Tess is going to take over for um, Jess for the rest of our half of our hundredth episode. Yes, we are going to conclude with the second half, and we are going to start. Let's do it, Tess. With newlyweds. Woo! Okay, so I hope that some of you guys watch newlyweds. For even millennials who haven't or Gen Z, they are all on YouTube. Every single episode is. It's such a comforting, good show. It's so entertaining. It's so like this is what reality used to be like when people could just be famous for like walking around the supermarket. It was not produced at all. Not at all. They only get in like two fights on the whole show, really. Yeah. But we know that they were getting fights off screen. Yeah, that's so true. Um, okay, so newlyweds. So Joe pitched an idea to MTV short like literally two months after their wedding. Like they went on their honeymoon and then he was like I need to make a buck. I hate this man. <laughs> yeah, I might as well make some money if I hate him. Exactly. Let me see how I can get involved. So it was a reality show starring the couple. And the series was originally going to be Lisa Marie Presley and Michael Jackson. Can you just like imagine what that show would have been like? What a different experience. What a darker experience. What a darker experience. That's for sure. Um, so the show which focused on the couple's marriage and the recording of Jessica's third studio album premiered on August 19th, 2003. Oh. So like we just were kind of saying, the show was truly lightning in a bottle. It just showed them doing these like non-produced activities that was still fascinating. They would go to chain restaurants all the time. Nick would be doing housework. Jessica would be shopping. But Jessica's portion of the show is so entertaining because this is when she's rising to stardom. So she's going to like all of these appearances and doing her concerts and doing red carpets. And then Nick's at home, like literally fixing the, the gutter. Because that's all he has to do. Like that's how he wants to fill up his time. And also like Jessica's just a star. She's so funny. Funny. Even when she's like cooking, she's like, ow. Ow. <laughs> that hurts. <laughs> she's just funny. She's she like. Lucille Ball. She is Lucille Ball. She's adorable, and she knows what she's doing. Yeah. So speaking on that, um, so the show became a pop culture ph phenomenon instantly, with Jessica's perceived dumb blonde antics on the show helping make the couple a household name. They basically were like, we want you to be ditzy. 
And she was like, uh, if it's going to bring in viewers, yeah, I know I'm smart, but I do have a ditzy side. Like I have always kind of said things and like asked questions that people think that I'm dumb. But she knew what she was doing. Also, yeah, ditzy and dumb are different. Exactly, Claire. Exactly. So to name a few iconic dumb blonde moments, mm. um, Claire, do you remember these from the show? And can you explain the context? Okay. Is this chicken I have or is this fish? Obviously, they are sitting on the couch and she's eating chicken of the sea, which is tuna fish. And, you know, it's confusing. If it says chicken of the sea, what does that mean? Thank you for defending her. I feel the exact same way. You're welcome. No. Well, she also just, <laughs> she goes, she goes, I know it's tuna, but like. It y- says yeah. chicken. Yeah. And then she goes, is that stupid? <laughs> and he's just staring at her and he doesn't say a word. Oh, God. We we need to do it for Halloween. We'll reenact we it. We need to do it for Halloween. We will. Um, no, I don't eat buffalo. <laughs> when they are at a chain restaurant and they're eating buffalo wings and she thinks that it's buffalo. Um, is it, is it platinum? <laughs> is it platamapus? Platamapus? Is it when they're golfing? No, it's, no, no. It's at the, um, no. like, it's an amusement park or something. Yes. She wins the yes. platypus. When she's back with them in Ohio. Yes. Back with his family. Platamapus. <laughs> platamapus. Um, something very different, sweetheart. Exactly. She knows at this point. Yeah, no kidding. What's going on? Um, so in open book, she says, hand it to my dad because he was absolutely right. People who had dismissed me as a Britney bot now heard me in a different way. Being the butt of the joke ironically gave me m- music credibility. I was the girl who burped. But hey, did you hear that girl singing to herself right after? There was no autotune in my kitchen. It turned out I had an amazing voice. I mean, that girl can belt it. And like she I mean, she's it is a marketing strategy because like, yeah, she's like you, you're seeing her with no makeup burping farting talking about going poop like i mean she's like talking about everything and then you see her opening doing the opening for some like troops and her singing like she loved opening for the troops we'll talk about it yeah we'll talk about it and the troops loved her yeah well i mean of course it can get lonely out there it sure can (laughs) that woman so gorgeous um and the show also just had teenage girls falling in love with her all over the world i was just obsessed like she was just so beautiful I mean we were we were two of them like I bought her products I went to her I went to her show that was the second concert I ever been to in my life she like, like hung out with her best girlfriends and just like well with Casey and like uh, she she was you were just like oh she's kind of like me and you never saw a celebrity like that before yes you looked up to her because she was aspirational and like she always carried Louis Vuitton bags uh, and she was rich and she was beautiful and she had this like insane body and at the same time, you're like, you're so down to earth. She is. You're, she's nice to people. Like, the way that she treats everyone is, like, kind. Kind. Mm-hmm. God, I love her so much. Me too. Um, so she's touring her third studio album, In the Skin. <sighs> um, it was re-released because of the show. Smart. So smart with new popularity. And her single, With You, sold over 3 million copies. With you. I can let my head down. I can say anything crazy. <laughs> oh, guys, it's so good. It's such a bop. Real me is a southern girl oh, with those Levi's oh. on and the open <laughs> heart. <laughs> I hope you guys are watching on I'm YouTube or Spotify. <laughs> oh my god, I have to pee and I almost felt like I peed my pants a little bit. I'm sorry. Um, wow, Claire, is that your song? Is it my song? My wow. song to you? What? No, I can't. I'm gonna <laughs> stop. <laughs> Um, so with you goes, so the sales are skyrocketing. Her dad says, Hey Jess, did you know that sales went up 200%? She goes, do percentages go up that high? A Ram question. <laughs> Great question. And he said, they do now. Ooh, Oof. Joe, I like it. Um, she says, I didn't care if people made fun of me because we were pulling in nearly 3 million viewers a week. Guys, that's like, that's like a 300 lot. viewers. 3 million oh. viewers. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like our old days. I was just going to say. Three million. Three million viewers a week. That a week is. Yes. And that's people not recording. That's people sitting down and watching that oh, live. I would just remember. God, I'm like, what day was it on? I just remember specifically laying on my floor, looking up at the TV yes, and watching same. it. same. And then getting it on DVD. Oh, oh I wish I still had those DVDs. Um, so then she comes out with this dessert line. Or with this line. <laughs> sorry. No. This line called dessert, mm-hmm. which at the time... I was like 11 years old being like, oh, it's edible lotions and mousses and 
lipsticks and which it was but it was for sexy time <laughs> it was definitely for sexy time and just like all these like 10 year old girls lining up like dousing themselves in this like you foreplay know, lotion <laughs> Like lining up to get auto, like an autographs lotion at Walmart. Truly, for, oh my god, for a play that you were not having. Literally, um, I had the vanilla. I don't know if I ever had dessert, but I really wanted it. Oh my god! I mean, without having it, I know what it smells like. I, it had a very very intense smell. Of course, um, it was that that I was really into, and then bless my grandma, may you rest in peace. <laughs> she would. <laughs> She would get me because of just how like I wanted to replicate her. She would get me the juicy blue smock dresses. Ugh. So I had one of those. Those terry cloth smock dresses. The terry cloth. And then she would get me Louis Vuitton bags for Christmas. Oh my gosh. I know Tessa's like I've And I still have them today. Been blessed enough to be able to wear the one that Jessica had of the white with the rainbow. Yes. Oh my she god. She did she did gift me with a very gorgeous purse. And we Collection honor her that, today for that. That I honor. But it was all for Jessica. Ugh. Like the cherry Louis Vuitton, which oh is such God. trash. I have those No, ones. it's not. I love it. I know. It's, it's chic now. So anyway, dessert is a huge success. It sells a record of $900,000 worth of product in one hour on, um, what's it called? The H- HSN? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Jessica and Tina love <laughs> HSN. For better or for worse. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> um. So we just see this little foreshadow of like how she is in business today. When she is in it, she's in it. And she's just a great, like, she knows marketing. She knows what the girlies want. And I think that it says so much about her because she's so relatable that people are buying it to be like her. Exactly. To like Mm -hmm. smell like her, to Mm -hmm. look like her, to just feel like close to her. It's crazy. Um, At the same time, she and Nick are on a bunch of variety shows. Oh, God. So they're everywhere just to show like how... In it, they were. Um, Jessica has a Christmas album, which, yes, oh, I have on vinyl. Rejoice. Rejoice. Spelled um, incorrectly, but in her way. Exactly. And you know that Claire and I have posted this photo. I mean, we have a whole TikTok about the photo of the album, the it's cover of this album. The hottest album cover you will ever see. It's gorgeous. gorgeous. It's gorgeous. Um, but, you know, with all of this success, Claire, do you have any idea how Nick is feeling about it? I imagine the same way that Mr. C.J. Walker was feeling last week. Not not well, bitch. Not well, bitch. So little Nick is struggling with something that we like to call toxic masculinity. <laughs> um, because his other half is getting this soaring financially. He's like, he doesn't hide it at all either. He's like, literally like, mm. no. And there is, there is a scene in Newlyweds where they hash it out about like oh it's so bad it's really bad it's basically like jessica comes back from a trip and she's like why did you decorate the office like this and he was like i mean you don't do anything so like and you've been gone so i have to and she's like well we should have hired a designer and he's like well why can't you do it and she's like nick i'm not here oh my god you do it so well (laughs) and then he's like oh you pretend that i'm not doing like the same shit you're doing she goes you're not doing half the shit i'm doing baby baby bread and butter guys it's so Uh, good but like man it's tough to watch and he's like you're bitching and you're doing this like it's bad he keeps saying yeah and he's just so threatened by her success and they both know there's no chance for him he's trying to do a solo career right now he tries to spend his (laughs) his management gives him ten thousand dollars to do um a music video for this song called shut up which (laughs) dak shepherd actually ends up being in the music video for this it doesn't make any sense they film it at their house because like there's no location budget (laughs) and nick nick asks her he's like uh yeah how much was uh your your music video for um Sweetest Sin. Sweetest Sin when they're like fucking on the beach. <laughs> yeah, with Joe watching them. It's so weird. <laughs> and what, is, what does Jessica say again? It's like, it's like 100 I think 150000 or, some, yeah, or yeah. something. And Joe's like, yeah, I think so. Give or take. <laughs> and Nick just like looks over and he's just like, he's turning red. He's so mad. Um, so there is this moment where Jessica says in the book, we were set, the two of them, to shoot the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. I know Nick saw that as the pinnacle of fame. And then one day my dad called me. He said, they just want you on the cover, Jessica, without Nick. She says that she remembered at the beginning of their career when they kind of started like skyrocketing at them as a couple. That one of the Sony guys that she worked with was foreshadowing this, saying, I just want everyone to know that in this show, 
there will be a winner and a loser in the situation. And let's just hope our girl is the winner. She said the problem was if Nick lost, so did I. Oh. And it's like that just sucks. Well, well, yeah, you don't want your husband and you to be pinned against each other. At no. the same time, like that Sony dude is right. He was so right. Like there's always a star. There's always always a star and it's like it's just so sad because if the roles were, were reversed it wouldn't even be a conversation oh he had such like judgment about the way that she would spend money like we see oh. this all the time on the show he's like how much were those sheets and she's like twelve hundred dollars it's like she she probably just made twelve hundred dollars in the last minute you were talking let exactly. her buy those sheets she should buy those sheets but he shames her throughout the entire entire show it's so gross so then we have jessica rise to fame with a little movie that she books. And this is really where things start changing. What does she book, Claire? Dukes of Hazard, Daisy Duke, y'all. Daisy Duke. These boots are made for walking. And that is just what they'll do. And that is what she did. She books um, Dukes of Hazard, which films in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, for three months. She says the best part of this time is that she's bonding with Willie Nelson, who's also in the movie, and his wife, in which they'd spend hours in the in the trailer singing with his guitar. Do you think that he offered her like a smoke? He he definitely offered her a hundred percent. I wonder though if she didn't want to take it. I feel like maybe she might have tried once. That's true. And then like coughed and was like, "That's not for me." That's true. I think this was. I think it's like this was an interesting time for her because her marriage, she knows, is falling apart. Yeah. They've been doing, like, they've only been doing the show for a year. Yeah. And this is second season of Newlyweds where she goes to do this and she is checked the fuck out. She, oh my gosh, you guys, when you see season two, you're like, she, it's so different than season one. It's so different. I mean, she's like 22 or 23 years old. Mm hmm. She's very young. Um, she says a highlight on set, too, was meeting Linda Carter, who played Wonder Woman, mm. and told her... And get, Daisy Duke. And Daisy Duke. And told her, get ready. People are going to want you to be in those Daisy Duke shorts for the rest of your life. Dun, dun, dun. <sighs> I have the chills again. I know. Um, she continues, she writes in her memoir that Linda said, putting on those shorts on, on set and having a group of people lean back to see if your butt looks good enough... Linda had been there, fighting for her rights and sat in tights, but she also told me to embrace playing such a strong forthright character, which once again, I think just represents what she's going through. She's kind of like coming into this to this dangerous time in celebrity and like female celebrity yeah. and at the same time feeling empowered that she's away from her husband and her dad for the first time. And like she says that she just really wanted to impress the whole cast and crew and she didn't want to be known as Nick Lachey's wife or that her dad had, you know, squeaked in to get her in with some deals to get her into this movie. It's just so crazy that she ever like was afraid of being known as Nick Lachey's wife. Like honey, no one gives a shit about this man. <laughs> truly. It's so true. Um, but it wasn't all, you know, fun and games on set. She was really struggling at this time with her eating disorder. Um, you know, she's wearing very skim risque mm -hmm. um outfits that's the whole point of daisy duke she has the short shorts she has this like pink hot pink bikini scene the spray tan was spray tan the spray tan was spray the extensions were extensioning they sure were they sure were um and she said this time was just kind of also in a way a blur of just working out for hours a day twice a day well she's like going through trauma with a disease like eating disorder so of course it's like kind of probably blacked out in a lot of ways a hundred percent and she's back on the diet pills and she's just really wanting everyone to think of her as this like sexy sex figure and, and the pressure is on yeah that i mean i mean think about all of her management no one's being like oh take care of yourself everyone's like yeah you need to have like an eight pack you have to prove yourself for this oh god <sighs> but at the same time at the same time say it just she notices a little someone on set who is it i uh, remember the actor johnny knoxville do player? i remember well he made he was a little jumping beeping for you wasn't he so johnny knoxville is one of my major crushes in my life i was way too young but i was also watching jackass like i was <laughs> looking him up on the internet i knew he had a daughter that was like my age i was like i'm prepared to be a stepmom oh, like, of course i loved johnny knoxville he's a bad boy who's like goofy but also seems kind he just seems so i don't know what it, he seems so sexy to me sometimes you can't explain it I, it, a lot it, of women it, felt like this it, he, I think he is a hot man. Well, Jessica also thought he was a hot man, Claire. Right. So they start having an emotional affair on set. 
Newlyweds is filming at this point. She literally hates Nick. You can see it in the footage. Yeah. She calls Nick after the first day of shooting, trying to tell him like what happened. He's cold and distant and like doesn't even like respond, she says in the book. What that he's he like so jealous. He's so jealous he can't even like be like proud of you. Like also imagine that you're already feeling distant from your husband and then you're away from them for three months. Like and then you meet this man who you immediately are attracted to. Oh my god. Who's also playing your brother. That's all weird. That's that is always, it's always tough. That part is always tough. She says about Johnny, I could share my deepest authentic thoughts with him, and he didn't roll his eyes at me. He actually liked that I was smart and embraced my vulnerabilities. But she also said that things never got physical between the two of them. She says, first off, we were both married, so it wasn't going to get physical. But to me, an emotional affair was worse than a physical one. It's funny, I know, because I had placed such an emphasis on sex by not having it before marriage. Mm. After I actually had sex, I understood the emotional part was what actually mattered. Johnny and I had that, which seemed far more of a betrayal to my marriage than sex. Ooh, Ooh. and there it is. Oof. Oh, my God. Jessica, she's such a good writer. She also, is. like, people on TikTok, we've talked about this on TikTok before, and they've come for us being like an emotional affair is not a thing. And what world? Of, cor- of course it is. It's all what she just said. I mean, like, yeah, say no more. Say yeah. no more. Show need a, needless to say. How did they not get physical? <laughs> it, it sometimes it's hard to believe that it do, that that no. didn't happen, but I believe everything that she says. Yeah, because she, I think she would have said it in the book. I think she would have said it too. I'm like maybe though a kiss, a little kiss. I mean, she's like Bill Clinton and being like it wasn't penetration. <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> we're know? like toxic. We're like if it's not penetration, <laughs> yeah. no. But I feel like. You know. Man, the sexual tension. Oof. Oh, I can't even think about it too much. I yeah, mean, I it, guess it played cousins, not brother and sister on that. But like, yeah, how do you cover that up? But that's also but he's like, like my of, first cousin. Yeah, <laughs> he's my first cousin. You have your cousins. <laughs> and you have your first cousins. Yeah. Yeah. So let's just say that Nick and Jessica, by the time that she gets back from shooting this movie, and Johnny is married, so they this dissolves, even yeah. though not suddenly they're still texting when jessica gets back they're writing each other like love notes via text like on t9 on t9 (laughs) like truly on her blackberry yeah also on newlyweds she is on her blackberry the entire time when she's with nick when they go to like miami for a quick like she has like three days off so they do like a group friend trip in miami she is chewing gum and texting for like days she's talking to johnny a (gasps) hundred percent and she's like so just like in a different world God, it makes me sad for her. I just want to be like, get out. Get out. I know. Like, honey, if you're not happy, get out. So when she does get back, they're trying to finish now season three of Newlyweds, where she says at this point, everything was actually like pretty fake because like the first two seasons you're seeing us like, she's like, at this point, we have nothing to talk about. We're becoming a little paranoid because we think like, even if the cameras aren't in there, like what if they left a hidden oh, camera? God. So they're only fighting when they leave and get in their car and they go to like a chain restaurant and they'll like talk about their issues there. Always at a chain restaurant. Red Robin. Shit comes out at Red Robin, you know? Literally. Um, Nick is suspecting that Jessica's friends are selling stories about them because now they're all over Us magazine being like, is something wrong? Divorce on the way? Like everyone knows that something ain't right. Yeah. Um, her best friend Casey, who was her assist, Casey Cobb, who was her assistant. Now she's like still best friends. She's also married to Donald. I forgot what his name is, but from Scrubs. Yes. Yeah. They're very, very cute. Mm-hmm. Um, she knows that Jessica's still talking to Johnny, and she's the only person that knows. And she's like, Jessica, like I can't support this. It's actually really hard for me right now to. And she's also, like, pretty good friends with Nick. Like, she's yeah. on Jessica's side, but she's like, you need to pick a lane because you are, like, cheating on him. But that's also being a good friend of being, like, even if, like, Nick is so toxic, it's like, okay, but then you just need to get out. Exactly. Yeah. Um, So sh- she's really, like, looking for a sign, I think, of, like, that final, like, what is going to happen where I can really have the strength to leave him. She goes on a tour to entertain the troops in Iraq. Of course she does. Of course she does. <laughs> they have to... She does, like, the tour, and then they have to stay overnight in Kuwait because there's this dangerous sandstorm. Oh, God. And she and Nick and her dad, who's there as well, are in a bunker. And it's, like, a little (laughs) bit of, like, a scary situation. Like, she's, like, I was pretty frightened. And in the book, she's very sweet. She's, like, I know I'm so privileged that, like, I could go home and everything. And she was, like, the first few days of the trip were actually really nice. Like, seeing Nick, like, talk to these soldiers, some who are 18 and 19. Like oh, those are, like, Nick's bros, too. You know, Nick's. Like, well, I think mm. she was kind of like, oh, look at him. Like, yeah. Bros. Like, <laughs> like you know, that's Nick's bros. Truly. And she was like, okay, like, I'm kind of like, you know, like, when you have that moment where you're, like, 
there's like that one final moment you're like wait I think I do love them yes and then it crashes yes so she's in this bunker she's literally texting Casey and her best friends and her mom being like I love you like I'm feeling like I don't know what's gonna happen I don't feel safe and then she said it occurred to me that God had placed me in this bunker with my two protectors Nick and my dad and I still didn't feel safe well, sweetheart, they were not your protectors, though. <laughs> She's like, it occurred to me, God placed me in this hellhole. Exactly. With, with these two men I really resent <laughs> yeah. for everything. No kidding. Um, so this is the kind of moment she knows. They have a final stretch when they get back to L.A. with going to therapy, their main fights and issues. Nick says that Jessica was so young when they got married and her inability to communicate. And she says, I feel like Nick hates me. <laughs> Oh, wow. She's like, he just doesn't like me. Yeah, that will do it. That will do it. <laughs> that will do <laughs> it. Um, the main diagnosis, he was withholding love while Jessica was withholding intimacy. She's withholding intimacy because he's withholding love. You know? Well, uh, uh, exactly. And also it's, like, it's not completely his fault. And I think she even says this in the book. She was so young. Like, they had no business getting married. No. No, they should have hooked up a few times. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. Like, if she wasn't religious, they could have just, like, had sex before. Yeah. And I think... They they like the idea of each other, and I think they were very physically attracted to each other. I I agree. Their sexual like um, chemistry is spot on. Season one when they're like in their pool and stuff, like yeah. they cannot keep their hands off each other. And I think he's like a Cincinnati boy that did want a wife, and mm-hmm. she thought that that's the kind of woman that she was. And she it turns out that's not the kind of woman she was. No, he wants her to go grocery shopping and yes. to cook and to clean. Like he like asks her like to clean. I'm yeah. like she has she's a millionaire. Yeah, she, Why would well, she she's be like busy. That's exactly? Just, like, that's not. Not her path. No, it's not her passion either. Exactly. It's definitely not. Definitely not. So, Jessica filed for divorce December 2005, citing irreconcilable differences. Their divorce was publicized worldwide and finalized on June 30th, 2006. Reportedly, she had to pay Nick $12 million in their <sighs> divorce since she had not signed. The what? The prenup. The prenup ladies. She had to pay him $12. $12 million. $12 million, you guys. In a 2015 interview, Jessica called her marriage to Nick the, her biggest financial mistake. Oh, my God. That's a lot of money to pay to someone. Iconic. Iconic. So they're divorced. Um, I have a... I have a picture of a piece of paper that I wrote the day that it happened. (laughs) Brooke, if you're listening, my best friend from elementary school, we both signed it saying how devastated we were, praying that they would get back together. Like I've prayed once in my life, and it was for Nick and Jessica. I don't even believe in God, (laughs) but for Jessica, I will. Um, Nick does like losery things by making like a trash music video with his now wife who like plays Jessica essentially in the single called What's Left of Me. And it's also crazy when you go back and look at TRL interviews and when Vanessa is interviewing Nick and Jessica or like Ashley or something. Yes. It's just like if you guys only knew. If you only knew. It's intense. It is intense. So hello, singlehood. Hello. She's like, hello. She's in her mid 20s. She's like, that's crazy. She's divorced. Yeah. She's rich as hell. Good for you, girl. Get your divorce. Even like no matter what age you are, get out if you're not happy. Get out. Exactly. Um, and so a lot of things are going on. A lot of good things. A lot of interesting things. She parts ways with Columbia Records and she signs with Epic Records. Her brand, the Jessica Simpson Collection, launches as a shoe collaboration at first with Nine West co-founder Vince Camuto. That's so crazy that Vince Camuto is a Nine West co-founder. I know. Isn't that wild? Yeah. I do love their shoes, Vince Camuto. Uh, Amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, She launches this company with one thing in mind, a decent price point with trends. She was like, girls were always asking me. Oh, my God. I forgot to get up my shawl. (gasps) Get it out, Tess. Hold on. Guys, do you know about this shawl? (laughs) <laughs> you you turn on um youtube or spotify right now if you're oh look at her look at her claire and allison gave this to me for my birthday so this Explain is it, claire. from so jessica simpson <laughs> on the show always wore this shawl like it was her signature shawl it was so chic and <laughs> we um got this shawl it's the it's same color from the same designer from the same designer i looked everywhere for the shawl when i was little Yes. When I was a teenage girl. And they found it and they got it for me. It, it was everything. And I know it doesn't look like much on it, YouTube. No, it, it is everything. Don't even downplay that shawl. It's everything, you guys. Um, it's also, it's not a cheap shawl. No, it's not. I mean, it's designer, Thank you, baby. Honey. Thank you. I'm taking video live. And we love it for our queen. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, she's like 
she says in the book, girls were always asking me where I got this cream shawl. And she was like, it was way too expensive to be like, oh, go here. She's like, so I'm going to make it for the girlies. I love that. Because she is like a down home, like Texas girl. Yes. That she's not like, oh, I'm rich now. So I'm going to make a luxury line. She's like, no, I'm going to make clothes for the women that I grew up with. Exactly. Exactly, Claire. Um, She and her hairstylist, Ken Paves or Pavs. Paves. Paves. I think it's Kim <laughs> Pavez. I think it's Kim Paves. Okay. Um, you guys remember him. Oh, you remember if him. If you were around at this time. They're not friends anymore, which I want to know why. I want to know why, too. Because they were, like, attached at the hip. Truly. Um, they launch a hair... Um, beauty products um, on the Home Shopping Network. Remember when they came out with the extensions? That's what I was just about to ask. I thought they were extensions. Yeah, the extensions. Of course. She does her fifth studio album, A Public Affair, which is like a fun 70s sort of like disco take. That song is so underrated, and it did not do well. It it only sold 500,000 copies. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. So there's like, but you know what I love about her right now? She's experimenting. She should. She's not like focused on anything except for like let's try a bunch of things out and like I've always been interested in fashion let's make a fashion line I can do pretty much any album I want to let's do like a disco album like that's exactly where she should be in her career exactly exactly um you know she films employee of the month (laughs) With Dak Shepard, yeah. Dak Shepard's like in their life all the time. Well, he was an MTV guy. So oh, that's maybe for, he that's was in punk. In punk, yeah. That's true. Yeah. Um, and then she has one of the darkest moments of her career. And we're going to talk about the moment. And then we're going to backtrack to say, what brought her here? Okay. How did this day happen? So, Jessica is asked to perform a cover of Dolly Parton's song. <gasps> no. Yes. Go. Sorry. Is it? Wait, <laughs> yes, yes. It is Dolly Parton. <laughs> Nine to five Ugh. as a tribute to the artist at the Kennedy Center Awards in December 2006. Jessica forgot the lyrics to the song and the performance received harsh criticism. She also received a chance to redo the song for the cameras, though her performance was cut from the broadcast. Ultimately, we have a TikTok about this that went viral. It was our first TikTok to go viral test. It was. It's when I didn't know that I could like <laughs> mute my sound. So I was eating an omelet while watching her <laughs> perform this and people were like, you're disgusting. <laughs> Um, I'm so because sorry. the music stops at the end and you just hear I'm just like going. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I just did it right now. Lord knows you're going to come for me. Yeah, it's fine, guys. It's our 100th episode. Yeah. You can't tell us anything wrong. Please just let us do, do, do what we want. Yeah. Please. Um, so, Claire, why do you think she had this breakdown? Was it a man test? It was a man, Claire. Was it John Mayer test? It was John Mayer, Claire. Wow. So she had started dating John Mayer. Yeah. He went through... So many gorgeous women in Hollywood. It's actually crazy. And like how many that we don't even know about? Jennifer Aniston. Taylor. Jennifer Love Hewitt. Katy Perry. Right. I was forgetting about Katy Perry. Yeah. Jessica. Um, I feel like there was someone else too. God, he destroyed these women. He destroyed Dear them. John. Track uh, five. That's like one of her best, Taylor's best track oof, fives. Oof, the electric guitar in it. Oh, um, so they had originally met in 2005 at like a Grammy Award party. Um, he came up to her and he was like, "Your single with you is powerful." Shut <laughs> up, John. Like, and she was like, "Oh, like," and she was like intimidated by him because he's course. like an artist and she's just a pop star and that whole toxic like narrative that you I, know she always felt. I think in herself. I think he also has one of those presents that it's like I think he is a magnet and he's a broken bird. Yeah, and you know what? women that struggle themselves internally are attracted to that. usually men that they want to fix he, and i have been there and it doesn't get you anywhere but everyone's been there of course he's the type of guy that'd be smoking a cigar and be like i just love women exactly you know? exactly exactly it's like you love to torture women and that is that is true yeah um so he started emailing her after he met her and said that he loved her her music he was like you're such an amazing artist you're more than this like dumb blonde and wife like I really respect you and this is when she was married and she was like it never got like anything other than that but he like made it known like I'm watching you wow the days of like emailing email this kind of stuff crazy it is crazy um so in 2006 they start dating and get into a serious relationship Jessica just describes it as very on and off toxic he would break up with her during you know or before emotional moments like 
the performance of Dolly Parton, he would decide, oh, you're not a woman enough for me. Ugh. You're not an artist like I am. I think, like, you don't, you're not intelligent like I am. He would use all of her biggest insecurities to weaponize against her. I've played in your chess game, but you change the rules every day. I mean, these women are telling are telling what it's like out there. And it doesn't seem good. It seems toxic. <laughs> seems terrifying, yeah, honestly. Yeah, it does. Um, she says, he dumped me and then come back saying he discovered he had loved me all along. Well, one of those times I wrote him this gushing letter thanking him for realizing I was worthy of love. And it breaks my heart to see how I practice the wording in my journal. I promise to be myself as I search to become the woman you already see. Oh, my God, honey. Oh, it's sweetheart. Like, no, you are enough of a woman for yourself and not for anyone else. Also, he seems like the type of guy like Patrick on Vanderpump Rules, Stassi's ex, that like always says big words and he, he doesn't quite even know what they mean. But exactly. he has to say them to seem smart. She said that this was also the time that she like started drinking mm -hmm. because she said and, and she had a lot of reasons why she was drinking yeah um yeah. she had been through a lot <laughs> yeah as we've seen as we've seen um but, but she would make her really nervous and like she would panic about texting him spelling something wrong via text or when they would be playing like he music together and he'd be playing the guitar and she'd sing she was like i feel like i couldn't sing in front of him because he'd be like Really? Like, you just hit that note? Like, he was so mean to her. I just, like, want for everyone to, like, not feel anxious around their partners. Like, of course you're going to be nervous in the beginning, but you shouldn't have to feel like you're on eggshells. No, like, your partner should be your safest place. Yes. Like, mm -hmm. that, you know, you can do or say anything without, like, judgment. Yep. And, you know, I hope all of our Rammies find that. I do, too. Um, So, they have so many breakups. They're on again off again this is the time where like i don't want to get into it because he's so fucking annoying but during a breakup john mayer does an intervo interview for playboy and says that having sex with jessica simpson is like sexual napalm yeah and like he didn't he didn't tell her that he was doing this article so jessica just gets a you know a notification that there's an interview out about you and it says that and like she's very private about that kind of stuff and she's like my grandma reads this well, not Playboy. But <laughs> well, hey, yeah, you never know. Read it for the article. Yeah, exactly. You just never know. Well, she says, like, in that interview, you know, where she's like, I was the good girl. Oh, like, love... and she has, like, she has been torn apart at this point mm -hmm. by, you know, not as much as we're about to see. But from, you know, she's she's in the spotlight. She's. Yeah, I love how she played it off. She's like, he ruined my game. She's so cute. I know she is. She's so cute. So they're they're off right now. They kind of officially go through their breakup. And then she starts dating a little football player. Oh, Tony. Named Tony Romo, which it's kind of like we need to talk about it because it's very – It's relevant right now. It's relevant. Um, so before Tony and Jessica met, uh, Tony expressed that he had a crush on Jessica. Um, she was is with her family watching a game, and afterwards, like, the reporters are asking him, like, who's your celebrity crush? And before – he, like, takes a moment before he says her name. She's like, he is so cute. And he's like, Jessica Simpson. <gasps> and she's like, we all, like, screamed. Like, imagine just, like. Oh, my God. That would be such a dream. I butterflies for her right now. Isn't that so cute? Okay, I need to take the shawl off now. So, and you're getting hot. I'm getting hot. Also, like, Tony Romo <laughs> was the, I believe, quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys. Like, she's a Texas girl. That's crazy. It's very, like, it's a love story, baby. Just say yes. It a hundred percent. It's does. kind of like what I think she needs after John too, like this good all American football player. Hey, we're seeing it now with Taylor. We're seeing it right now. They immediately get into a serious relationship. Excuse me, after their first date. Oh wow. Um, and you know it's tough because Jessica's going to the games. She's wearing her cute little pink jersey yes. for him, and every time they lose. Who does the crowd? Who do the fans? Who do the fans blame? They don't blame the players who lost the game. They blame the player's girlfriend who showed up to support her partner. Exactly, because she has magical witchy spells that can <laughs> yeah. make her boyfriend look, like. Why would she even want that? Why would? Yeah. How is it her fault? Explain that to me. So people are calling her a bad omen. Oh my god! They're booing her. They're you know, report NFL reporters, or whatever, are doing little bits about her. That is just like that is just. It's Stupid. crazy. How do you get there? Get a hobby. Get a hobby. Get literally. a hobby. Um, and another thing why the relationship is a little tough is because little John, John Mayer, is not only like still texting and emailing her, 
he's hanging out with her parents constantly. The betrayal of Tina and Joe to go and hang out with John. The, it's I, I'm always speechless actually during this because I, I'll just read the quote of because she's literally like, how could how could you do this to me? She said, it didn't help that my parents had been hanging out with John Mayer. It was so bizarre. In early 2009, John rented a place in Hidden Hills. He had turned this home into a studio to record battle studies. It was about 14 miles from my parents' house in Encino. And they told me about having him over. They would even sometimes go pick him up to spend time with him. Gated community playdates. At first, I thought they were kidding. But then I realized he had also stayed friends with Pete Wentz, who was dating... Oh, Ashley Simpson. And Ashley, too. That's not okay, guys. Especially, it's like, it's one thing if it was just like a mutual breakup. It's it's a little weird. But they don't have kids. They don't have a family. And he's toxic as hell to her. Why do you need to be in his life at all? Toxic as hell. Like, and you know what he's done to her. She's also like with someone else. And she's yes. living at the time with him. She's kind of playing house with him in Dallas. It's so disrespectful. Which is hard for her because she wants to be in LA, I think. Yeah. And like, so this is an interesting time. Um, Tony sees a text one day from John being like, um, I was at your parents' house and I like couldn't like fix this door. Like something like about like the house. John, you're not trying to fix shit, you know? Like stop, stop pretending. Yeah. Um, he sees this and in their relationship in the past with Tony and Jessica, if John had reached out to her, she would like show him to almost be like, she, she would literally say like, like an addict being like, mm. I'm about to relapse. So just know that he did this and like, I'm not going to do it. And she doesn't show the, him this one, but somehow he sees it and he's like, oh, you're having an affair with him. Oh, God. And she's basically like, fuck, two years of like trying my best to not interact with him. And then Tony loses all trust for me. So they're going through it. They don't officially break up yet. Um, Jessica comes up, comes out with a country album because our girl is eclectic. She is. She can do it all. People. She can do it all. Um, she writes a lot in this album, which is really fun for her. It's called Come On Over, and it's number one in country for a while. I love. We love. Um, she goes on tour and opens for the Rascal Flats. Love. And she performs in Texas at the Chili Cook-Off. <sighs> yeah. And... This is always one of the most frustrating parts of of her story, really. I mean, it's absurd. No, it actually is. And, like, we all owe her an apology, and we'll get there. We will get there. So she's wearing size 4 jeans, a leopard belt, and a black tank top. She says she has the best time recording or performing. She feels free. She's loving being in the South. She's loving this country album. She said she before she went on stage, she just felt really beautiful and, like, yeah. really hot. The world sees this performance, and pictures come out. And literally the entire world, all of the media, aggressively, disgustingly body shames her, calling her fat, Jumbo Jessica, she's let herself go, what's happened to her. Like, guys, she's on the cover of every magazine. It's like the world news that Jessica Simpson is like this. I remember reading a Vanity Fair article later and there was this guy who was interviewing her and in the Vanity Fair article, he was like, I was just so distracted. Every question I asked, I'd be like, how's your life going now that you're fat? How's making music now that you're fat? I'm not even like, I. it's so disgusting. And think about that. This is the time that we all grew up in. Yeah. So, of course, that we are going to have body dysmorphia, all of us. Of, of course, you, like, see Jessica Simpson as the most beautiful woman. At least I did. Like, I that is did. yeah the ideal, the most beautiful woman in the world, like, just perfection. And then you see a picture of her looking extremely small and beautiful and all the things. And then being like, oh, she's now – that's she's not desirable. And even if she wasn't, like – why are we blasting this? Why is this world news? It's crazy. Why is any person that gains or loses weight, why is this on the cover of a magazine? That is the question, Tess. Who cares? Literally, who cares? And remember, too, that this woman was starving herself mm -hmm. for her entire life mm -hmm. and most likely miserable mm -hmm. in that experience and on diet pills and having people tell her you're not like good enough. It's just so upsetting to me. And she felt so beautiful. She's coming into her own as an artist. And you want to ch talk about her body? The most least interesting thing about a person is what their body looks like. Literally. Literally. So Jessica sees all of this. Um, she writes in her journal, Today breaks my heart because people say I'm fat. Why does the cruel opinion of this world get to me? 
She goes on to write that she spends 80% of her day thinking about her body Mm -hmm. and that she fears that she could lose everything as a result of her self-doubt. She just says that she spent years beating herself up, feeling like a failure for not reaching this unrealistic body standard. And she is asked to go on like a press tour about it. (laughs) This is so crazy. And her publicist is like, you know what? Go on, go do one interview to shut everyone up. Yeah. And Jessica was like, well, what should I say? And her publicist is like, you need to say those were size four jeans. And and she goes, I am not going to do that because if I, of course, my ego wants me to. Mm-hmm. If I go on national television and I have all of these 12, 13, 16, all of these women that look up to me. And now she has a fashion line. So she has an older fandom as well. And she goes, I'm a size four. And then they are going to equate that to being fat in their minds. That is the most responsible response to not say the size. And like, again, to have to put your ego aside. It is so selfless. Truly so selfless. Wow. I know. And so she, she does like one interview about it. And she's like, this is crazy that this is news. I'm really happy. I hope that women feel good about themselves. I've been, you know, and I've had so many different like phases of my life of how I feel about my body it's a struggle and I hope that like we can all do better not make women feel like shit no kidding so she and Tony break up after this not because of this instant not because of this but she's like Tony liked Jessica Simpson Mm. and then he wanted me to become this version of Jessica Simpson of cooking staying home she's like he wanted me and she's like and I kind of wanted that too to be like the other wives and girlfriends of the football players. She's like, but for me, when I was getting dinner and like going to the supermarket to check out, I'd see my face on the cover of every magazine yeah. in like the small town. And she's like, I just couldn't do it anymore. He also didn't want her to continue doing movies because he didn't want her to kiss other co-stars. That is when actors are say that, like that they, it's just so, it's an acting, babe. It's acting. And like that their partners would expect them not to do that. It's just so crazy. Crazy. Don't date an actor then. Exactly. So they break up, but true love was coming for her. <gasps> That's right, Tess. And this is our this is our conclusion of this is our final chapter uh, of Jessica. I don't want it to be over. I know our sweet sweet baby. So Jessica starts dating retired NFL tight end Eric Johnson Woo! in May 2010. And I read this chapter yesterday because I like needed like a refresh on yeah. how they met. Hot. It's okay. You tell it. Hot. So they meet through mutual friends. Um, Eric ends up coming over to her place one day because she's watching basketball with a bunch of friends and however it happened if he's like, oh, I'll go over to like Jessica Simpson's house. Like yeah. hot. Sweet. Uh, truly. Um, he meets her when she's wearing a big gray sweatshirt, short shorts and Uggs. Well, I mean, no woman has ever been hotter in that outfit than Jessica Simpson. <laughs> Literally. I can't even think about it. And their first conversation, conversation she said was about dreams and magic. Oh. It's so her, too. It's so her. He stays all day. The party leaves. They end up hooking up that night. Love it, girl. Which we love that. Get yours. Get yours. And then the couple announced their engagement in November of that the year. Next day. Oh, it wow. was quite quick. Wait, when did they? They they dated for six months before getting engaged. They got engaged on um, 11-11, which was the date of our live show. And our girl's spiritual, and she loves that. It, cosmic. Yeah. Co- cosmic. Um, She describes him as her soulmate, that God literally put her on this earth to marry him and have children with him. They are soulmates. I believe that. I believe it, too. She's like, he's this smart and thoughtful Massachusetts boy. He played football at Yale and now is like healing himself and into, you know, herbal homeopathic medication and yoga. And he's very like gentle and very like he's like this hippie hot salt and pepper man he really is and like a football player he's like big and can like scoop her up yes i just think they're perfect for each other i agree it's exactly what she needed and i'm just telling you guys the way he stood up to defend his woman it was really really hot just you go look at a picture of him and then imagine him doing that and you save that for later You're i saw welcome. him at sushi one time in 2016 with a friend um and i just i was literally like is that like i think they had like just started date shwow shwow i think he smokes a lot of weed he definitely does yeah i think he definitely does he definitely does um um but you know with with the love and with all of the beauty that comes in a new relationship Jessica's really, really struggling. She's running her empire. It's now worth, like, so much money, like half a billion dollars or something. Um, You know, so she's making bank, and she's falling in love, and she's getting pregnant, and she ends up having three kids, Maxwell, Birdie, and Ace, with 
with this gorgeous man. Um, but her parents filed for divorce yeah. after 34, 34 years of marriage. That's a lot. It's a lot to take on. They've all trauma bonded at this point. A hundred percent. Doesn't you know? he tell her when she's like about to give birth or something? She, uh, yeah, I think she's literally about to give birth and he comes into the hospital and tell, and Eric is like, get the fuck out. Hot. No kidding. She fires her dad as her manager. It's about time. Um, saying, sadly, this is one of the hardest things I've ever done. The worst part of it was that I had to do it five times because he just wouldn't accept it. This man does not have any boundaries. No, 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 no. Um, so that's really tough. But then she gets this huge deal with Weight Watchers because of, you know, her pregnancy. She's gaining, she's gaining weight. She's losing weight. People are obsessed with her gaining and losing weight. They really are. But she's like, I'm making millions of dollars from <laughs> yeah. every ad. So whatever. Cha-ching. Um, but after giving birth, it's a, to Maxwell, her first daughter, it's a tough time for her. She would really prioritize losing the weight. She started drinking a lot. She was taking like, I think diet pills and stimulants again. Mm. Um, and meanwhile, just trying to be a new mom. Meanwhile, trying to be a new mom and having the media follow her, just obsessing over her body. It's yeah. like, no, like, th- th- guys, like, if you don't remember this time, it's all it still was about Jessica. There was nothing about her celebrity anymore. No. It was just about her body. It really was. It's crazy. It was crazy. Yeah. Like, I, it's it's surreal kind of to, like, remember. Um, they're, you know, new parents. They're hosting parties a lot. She just says that she is filling up this little gold glitter tumbler with vodka all day, every day, pretending that it's water. Wow. that It's crazy to think that that's how she was living her life. I know. I mean, just like really drinking throughout, throughout the day. And so after her second kid is born, she gets a partial tummy tuck thinking it would help mm-hmm. cure her depression. The doctor was like, all right, like everything looks good. You just can't drink three weeks before this. And Eric, like, looks at her and he's like, you can't do this then. Because, like, I know that you can't not drink for three weeks. And she does it anyway. And she says she kind of, like, risks it because she doesn't go completely clean for three weeks. Oh, my God. There's so much there on both sides. On the drinking, on the tummy tuck. Like, there's so much there. Yeah, like, she's just kind of going, like, a little manic, like, in between kids. Like, I think, like, and I have heard this from women that struggle with alcoholism. Like, when you're pregnant, it's kind of this, like, golden time mm. because you can't drink. Right. You kind of are feeling, like, fulfilled and the hope of, like, new possibility, you know. Right. And then so you have something to focus on almost. E- exactly. Yeah. And you just can't do drugs or, or drink. Yeah, exactly. But in between kids, it, it was really tough. Um, she goes on Ellen DeGeneres. That when interview. she's pregnant with her third kid. Was so tough. Wait, was she pregnant on that? No, she wasn't pregnant oh, on... Oh, she wasn't? The Ellen interview when she was drunk? Oh, wait. No, no, no. She's She just had her third yeah. kid, I think. And she's like 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 two months postpartum or I think something. it was after Ace. Because What's I think after Birdie... Yeah. It's Maxwell, Ace, oh, and yes. Birdie. Her second. Yeah. God, now, like, they're all blending together. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, no, no. This is good. Um... And she's wasted on Ellen. It's a really tough interview. And Ellen is not doing her any favors. Ellen is making her feel like shit. Yeah. And it's like, if that's like your show, like. That's your guest. Help her. Yeah, exactly. She goes on HSN with her mom. Oh, that was also really tough. And she's also like pretty fucked up. Um, And she has this Halloween party in 2016 in which she says she hits rock bottom. She started drinking early in the morning. She couldn't take her kids trick or treating. And the next morning, her friends have an intervention when, when they're like, look, we have taken all of the alcohol bottles out of the house. It is time. It is time. And um, she actually wrote a post last year um, on her Instagram. And she's basically just like, I can't believe it's been four years. The real work that I needed to be done in my life was to actually accept failure, pain, brokenness, and self-sabotage. The drinking wasn't the issue. I was. I didn't love myself. I didn't respect my own power. Today, I do. I've made nice with the fears, and I've accepted the parts of my life that are just sad. I own my personal power with soulful, soulful, soulful courage. Uh, I mean, how how could you expect anything different from her? Her whole life, she's been told, when you become Jessica Simpson, like yes, and it's like I people have so how could put you love her in yourself? Those, people have put her, like isolated her from herself exactly, and like that just must hurt. From when she was a little girl. Yeah, and then always been like more, more like the parents that you're supposed to trust the most. Yeah. Not looking out for your best interest. It's just like devastating. And then you have the whole world constantly attacking you. Yeah. It's so it's so true. She's really just been through so much. Um, so I'd like to end with a little small passage that I think will resonate with a lot of people. 
it's very, very sweet. Like made me tear up today when I was oh, reading gosh. it. Um, and I just think this is so beautiful. So she says, sometimes we're all so afraid to be honest with ourselves because we know that honesty will lead us somewhere. I wrote this 10 years ago in my journal. Can fear walk us towards something better? I can say now that the answer is yes. I knew that then too, but I still had to phrase it as a question because I wasn't ready. I had to walk through my fear to be here writing to you about the painful moments in my life. Pain is where all the tools are, as my therapist said the other day. If you're someone who has a lot of tools, I'm sorry, but I'm also hopeful to you. You have so much to work with. I think it's important, no matter your situation, to turn inward. So often we turn away from ourselves just to numb our feelings and to get through the day. You deserve to feel the heartbreak and pain all at once that you can stop holding yourself back from feeling whatever you've tried to mask. Oh, my God, Jessica. Jessica, you're killing me. Wow, well said. What a beautiful passage. Isn't that stunning? And today... Her clothing line, the Jessica Simpson Collection, is worth $1 billion. Billion, honey, she, not million. Billion. Billion. She, she lives with her kids and husband in Calabasas. Her memoir, Open Book, released in 2020, sold 500,000 copies in the first three months. That's crazy. Her net worth is almost $300 million. We had someone on TikTok one time being like, John Mayer is so much more successful than her. And I was like, check check the net worths, honey. Honey, the Jessica Simpson Collection is not fucking around. No kidding. And she has been saying toying that she's going to be going on tour this year and coming out with new music you guys know we will be there like front row and to end everything this entire episode with a quote that represents why we started ram say it dumb is just not knowing ditzy is having the courage to ask that's right honey well can we put Woo! that on a t-shirt i mean truly is that amazing dumb is just not knowing being ditzy is having the courage to ask Oh, that is why we have Ram. Oh, that's why we have Ram, guys. Ask all and like that. She has inspired us to ask the questions. It actually makes you sound smarter when you ask all the questions. It does, and if like people laugh at you, laugh with them. Like it's don't take yourself so seriously. No. Also, most people don't know the answers to the questions either. So. Literally. Oh, uh, Jessica, Jessica, we love I you. Love We're sweet you. angel. Thank you for taking us here. Uh, seriously, and Rami's, thank you for taking us here to our hundredth episode. My. God, that was our 100th episode. I know. It's crazy. And we specifically want to thank a few Rammies yes. who participated in our 100th episode challenge last week. I'm not going to say the last names to protect, you know, privacy. privacy. But a quick honorable mention to Taylor, Taylor, Grace, Mallory, Isabella, August, Hannah, Demi, Maddie, Emma, Sammy, Caroline, Ella, Alice, Carissa, and Rebecca. You angels. You angels en- enjoy your shirts and tag us in photos when they come to you. That's right, guys. Yes, you can follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Right Answers Mostly. If you've loved this episode, please, please, please share it. Um, in our show notes, you can buy merch. You can join our Patreon. Um, you can do all the things. You can do all the things. But yes, please share this episode. It would be a really special treat just yeah. to have everyone share the 100th. And everyone tag Jessica in yes. our um, Instagram post. Please. Yes. <laughs> oh, guys, we love you. Thank you. I can't wait for 100 more episodes of Ram. Oh, same. We love you guys so much. And to Jessica. To Jessica. Bye. I can let my head down. I can say anything. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>